Tony Dunn, and not to it but to do it, brother. Let's roll. In a world where Carolina Panthers fans have an insatiable thirst for Panthers news and opinions, only one podcast roars ferociously. It's the C3 Panthers Podcast. Come on in, take a seat, Panther fans, with the longest running Panthers podcast out there. It's the C3 Panthers Podcast, and it's Tuesday night where we chop up the latest Panthers news and opinions from the fan perspective. My name's Tony Dunn. They call me the professor, and I'm here with my wheel man, Cody Lashney. What is up, my man? Tony Dunn, we're rocking uh, like old times, man. Just me and you, man. CK and Greg uh, have some stuff they're getting done tonight. But we're going to hold it down like we always do. The Panthers have a brand new defensive coordinator. And Panther fans seem to be pumped about Ijiro, Ivero, Ivero, Evero. We're already Tomato, tomato. Yeah, we're already determining how to say his last name. But, dude, uh, Deuce Staley is a new coach on the Carolina Panthers. Steve Wilkes is going to be the new defensive coordinator of the San Francisco 49ers. Tony, you already know there's so much to talk about, so much to get into, but we're going to do it with the best damn Panther fans and all the YouTube, and you already know them and love them, our man Joey the Blind Panther, 910 Panther fan, Anthony Piccarello, Joshua Hall, Just Don't Care, Ken Fokensi, Lawrence Trevette, Lynn Leonhart, Michael Davis, Pac MD, Pad One Panther, Raleigh Lee, Rock Rhyme, Smells Like Blue, The Cardiac Cat 13, Tim Estes, Underground West, Tony Dunn, ain't nothing to it but to do it, brother. Let's roll. I love seeing all those little green, those green name tags uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our chat. I'm pretty sure they're green in the YouTube chat. Those are C3 super fans. Those people are diehards. They rock with the C3 Panthers podcast. We thank you for your support. That's a small donation that they give the podcast $1.99 a month and get some of those cool tags, loyalty badges, and cool emojis. But you know how you can support the show? You can smash the thumbs up button. You can subscribe to the longest running Panthers podcast, heading, finishing up our 10th season as a podcast. Haven't missed a week since 20. 13 when I started this show way back when good Lord, it's been a fun ride. We love having you here with us. And we are so close to 5,000 subscribers, folks. We are, we're 100 subs away, 4,900. We hit today and our small, humble podcast, but our wonderfully brilliant community continues to deliver. So smash the thumbs up button, be a part of the show. Call in to the show at 252-228-5098. We want to hear your thoughts on our new defensive coordinator. Will the Carolina Panthers find an offensive coordinator? We heard about Jim Bob Cooter a couple of, about a week ago. Favorite but boy. Name. I know best. Who doesn't love Cooter? All of a sudden, yeah. this is that all silent, though, Qu- all quiet on the offensive coordinator front some people are even dropping names like a Jim Nagy potentially after this Super Bowl so we want to know what you guys want to talk about jump in that chat and tell us uh because this is a show by fans for fans rock with us uh and uh man we're even going to be talking about panther fans bantering back and forth with uh Shaq Thompson and other players Matt Rule, egos, they don't go away. Uh, So it's going to be a fun show. Go ahead and get your calls in, folks, because we're going to start sprinkling the calls in more uh, throughout the show tonight and hopefully going forward uh, and not just, uh, uh, you know, trying to, I guess, make it more integrated into the show. So go ahead and call in 252-228-5098. Cody, let's go ahead and jump in tonight's show. And the big news is uh, the Panthers are starting to build their staff. And one of the things that Frank Wright was, uh, you know, there's a story. Actually, let me just bypass to this. Is Joe Person put out a story on The Athletic 
and it's kind of like a detailed moment by moment, day by day account of the uh, coaching hire. But really what the, or like, uh, like how they were doing the interviews, who was doing when, who was doing what, uh, there was a lot of rumors. There was a lot of conjecture behind the scenes. But one of the things that Frank Reich brought to the table uh, was not only experience and an offensive mind, but connections in the NFL that he had been cultivating since he had even been fired from Indianapolis lists of names that he had been in contact with and uh, trying to say like, this is, it's important for him uh, to put together a top staff. And this was really important or resonated with David Tepper, who spoke a lot about it uh, and why they selected him. And Frank Wright mentions like, we've got to get a great staff together. Frank Wright has had a history of getting good putting together a talented staff. I mean, if you look at it, they're all in the freaking Super Bowl right now. Yeah. And uh, this name right here, Ajiro Evero, 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 Tomato, Evero. Tomato. Evero, Evero, Evero. 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 This Ch- name. How do you say it? Yeah. This name is the hottest name on the block right now. And I got to just say this is I don't know how many people in the world – I've been following defensive coordinators, but this name, haven't seen anybody say anything bad about this guy. Not a single person is like, oh, I wish we would have gotten Fangio. In fact, he is a Fangio. He's a young Fangio disciple. Listen, out of all the defensive coaches that were out on the market, Ejiro Ivero, his name was number one amongst them all. In fact, he was even getting head coaching interviews. Uh, We had interviewed him. Uh, for the head coach, there was a bunch of different teams that wanted this guy to potentially be a head coach. He's by far the most coveted defensive coach that was out there on the market. And listen, I know we're going to talk about Steve Volks a little bit later, but now you're finally seeing the benefit. Well, I say finally, but I should say already, you're seeing the benefit of the type of people that Frank Reich can bring into the organization and that his name and his resume and the things that he has done in the NFL, it means a lot. And people feel like the Panthers are building something really, really nice. And Zero Vero was one of them. Uh, so a few points about uh, Zero here. The first year as a defensive coordinator, he coached the Denver defense that ranked top 10 in total defense despite injuries that were up and down the roster. Uh, and he was the despite defensive- trading away Bradley Chubb, one of the you right. know, I mean that a coveted player, and yeah. despite this, or in spite of an offense that didn't put any points up, dude, this defense was on the field the whole fucking season. How many yeah. excuses were made for Carolina defenses over the last two three years about like, oh, imagine how good this was if the offense could actually move the ball and score. The Broncos averaged like 10 points a game. Yeah. Their offense was very, very bad. I mean, there's a reason why this dude was the number one amongst most defensive candidates. And it really has a lot of Panther fans, myself included, fucking pumped for Jeremy Chin and J.C. Horn, maybe even a guy like Dante Jackson because of his pedigree and what he's been able to do with that defense for the Denver Broncos. Um, I wanted to play this clip. Uh, This was when he was still with the Broncos. And I wanted to play it. And then I want to talk about what this means for the future of the Panthers' defense. Three, four in our base defense will play a a variety of uh, sub packages. Um, You know, there'll be a lot of carryover from what these guys did last year. Uh, But at the end of the day, um, you know, Coach Allen was just talking about the evaluation. You got to start with the evaluation of your players. You got to see who's in your roster. You got to see what they do well. And then the scheme has got to fit your players, you know, and we got, you can't go the other way around with that. All right, dude. Scheme has to fit your players. But he also mentioned, he also mentioned, Tony, something that we have been mentioning for a long time and that a lot of fans have been mentioning for a long time. And that's a 3 4 defense. Do you think this is finally the moment in time 
where the Panthers finally make that leap to the 3-4 like has been talked about for a long time. I have no idea. And when I say I have no idea, I mean, like, it sounds awesome. It sounds awesome if you have the right personnel, Every tell, everyone tells us, or whatever it is. is but all I know is this. is what, This is what I know about a 3-4 defense. Historically, it has fucking driven the Panthers' offense nuts. Yes. Every time the Panthers have played 3-4 defense, I felt like we just got mollywhomped. And tell me but if I'm wrong when here. we play the three four defense, I feel like everybody molly wamps us. Yeah, but so we never really, know. we never even committed to it right with the correct personnel. I feel like we kind of half assed the three four just because Ron Rivera felt they needed to do something different to save his but job. Pepper potentially influenced yeah. him a little heavily. But I feel like Ivero, Evero, Ivero, however you say his name. I we feel just gotta, like just go with it. Just he is it. more of a specialist in this type of regard. And I feel like if the Panthers know that they're going to be a three, four, they can start building through the draft in this direction. And I think that can kind of mold the way that we do things going forward. But Tony, something else I've noticed about three, fours. I don't know if you agree or not. I find that the most ferocious pass rushing defenses normally always come from a 3-4 rather than a 4-3. I feel like it's harder to find. How about this? It's harder to find 4-3 defensive ends than it is to find 3-4 outside linebackers. Uh, Look, I think this is a great comment in the chat. The next one, the very next one, 3-4 is easy to run on. 3-4 assumes every, every team is passing. That's how you crack a three four defense. It feels like is to just run at it, run at it. Um, I don't know, you know, Cody. I won't, almost wonder this is when I look at these defenses, and again, I I tell you this is I'm an expert football fan, not a football expert. Uh, so I'm not great at telling you exactly what the X's and O's are and the right. I use the eye test. It works pretty well. It sometimes I watch a lot of football. Um. I don't know if the distinction between 3-4 and 4-3 is as as different as it used to be in the past. And what I mean by that is uh, when you got four guys with their hand in the dirt versus four guys on the line of scrimmage, but two of them are standing up, is that really different? You know what I'm saying? If you're putting four dudes on the line of scrimmage, whether they are rushing like, with, like Hassan Reddick was – and we'll talk about him later in the show, these stand-up rushers, if they're rushing the passer, is it really a 3-4? You know what I'm saying? And I I mean, I know it technically is because you're putting the nose and the things like this. I I do think is that 3-4s are suited for the modern-day defensive end. And what I – is that the league – Look at Brian Burns. Who Brian Burns is a little light in the ass if you think about like a type of defensive end. And he's bigger than a Reddick and all these other guys. Like you can't even call some of these guys defensive ends, but that's how you use them. Well, and when he was coming out in the draft, everybody thought that he was best suited as a 3-4 outside linebacker. In order to fit as a 4-3 defensive end, he's put on a lot of weight. He's put on some muscle and he's tried to have, you know, be that hand in the dirt type of guy. But Tony, that's why I tell you that those players now are more rare to me. Because if you imagine an outside linebacker, think of Son Reddick. You could be six foot two, two hundred and thirty pounds, and be a dynamic 15 a sack a year type of outside linebacker. Whereas if you're a defensive end, you're probably around 6'5", 6'6", and you're probably upwards of 265. And I think finding those... Oh, that's big, light, bro. That's still I mean, light. Right, even more. But that's you my need point. 285. The, big, the bigger, more athletic guys are just flat out harder to come by. And I also feel like you're right. And people have mentioned this in the chat. A 3-4 defense, it's not the best at stopping the run. That's kind of been one of the drawbacks of that 3-4 defense. It doesn't have to be bad. Probably have to have, yeah. Having, right. having, big, having bigger men up front is, as a rule of thumb, better for stopping the run. 
sure, sure. I think the other thing is this, is when I think of the three, four, the the historic three, four defense, not the new one maybe, is uh, and why it didn't work, right, is uh, I think of people like Quentin Copels. Quentin Copels is a North Carolina guy. He's from Kinston, North Carolina, went to Chapel Hill, was a guy that – Old school Panther fans, not old, but if you going back to 2013, 2014, I forget when he came out, people were hype about him. He went to the Jets in the first round, and he was drafted as that athletic uh, defensive end who could rush the passer and drop back into coverage. I think that those guys are all liabilities at the end of the day in coverage, right? So is that like if you run that, you just have to understand that their whole job is to rush the passer. You know, like uh, they said this is I saw Hassan Reddick's defensive coordinator say this earlier in the season. He had 17 sacks this year. And he said he probably would have have would have had 25 if I hadn't have dropped him back into coverage so much. Right. And I just uh, it's hard for me to say is like, how do you use these guys? I just don't want Brian Burns. On running backs, I don't want Brian Burns on wide receivers, and that's what you do. That's how you attack those things. So, how do you? And I'm 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 hoping, and I, I trust these guys know how to mix it up in the right way. I think you have to have. Again, I think he's right here. Is that you don't? And and this is the archaic ver- version of football. Is where your scheme you bring in players to fit your scheme. Uh, yeah. Or maybe not that is maybe I'm not doing that is, but you go like, this is how we do it. This is what we're doing. Instead, the whole part of the NFL is everybody is good. I love the saying good on good, right? Is everybody is good. And Brian, Frank Wright said that in his press conference It's good on good. We got to get the most out of our guys. We have to make it about our players and what they do. Great. So I, I, I respect his position and I'm, and I, and I trust his wisdom on this. But I just have never seen – first, we just never had success with it. But we've only tried it twice in our history or three times. Totally. One, yeah. I think we were it, like a three, four, even, like in the early – or the like early in our tenure. Then you had yeah. that Ron Rivera year where it was just like, pff, we don't know. We can't stop the run and for shit. it felt rushed. It felt forced. It felt like they didn't really even fully They changed mid-season, I think, yeah, and, or something. Well, no, we did it before the season, but it felt like the players – that we had drafted it's like we didn't really even commit to a full three four defense like we kind of just took the four three players that we had and then tried to fit a square peg in a round hole for yeah we had older players you don't know how good he was and how familiar the staff was at teaching it it was teaching it on the fly to a certain degree and the only other reason the time i've seen it is that three three five you know, I know that's not a what? three, four, but like, yeah, it's like the collar. And then you're just like, oh, God, I just haven't seen us had success when you only put three men on the front line. Right. Uh, but uh, this guy, you're coming from a team, though, who has a history of fucking dominating with that shit. I mean, yeah. guess who? Isn't that what the Broncos ran against us in the Super Bowl where they ate? Yeah, our they've, they've always been a three, four team. And, that, and that's what I'm saying. Right. It, listen, I'm excited for an aggressive Panthers defense. I want us to be kicking quarterbacks' ass up and down the field. And I, I feel like an aggressive type of defense is what the Panthers need. We need you to know play what they more. need is good players. Yeah, but That's we have they fucking need is we good. need. No, we, we have the player. Yeah, we do. We Bullshit. have the players to play man coverage, Tony Dunn. I take J.C. Horn over Patrick Sertain any okay. day of the week. And we, we have the players – that are built for man coverage. And in fact, this was some of the drawbacks from Steve Wilkes. People felt like Steve Wilkes played that off man coverage too much in the vein of a Ron Rivera and that it was causing too much of a cushion for opposing teams to just dink and dunk their way to a first down and pick when they want to take shots. I just don't know so, if we got the defensive front. Well, we're going to have to build this way. This is going to be a process. We're just now getting in our new head coach. We're just now getting in our new defensive coordinator. We are starting to move in the right direction. Yeah. But we need, we need to continue to draft well. And Fitterer 
in my opinion, has never been more important to this organization than right now. Now we're about to really see if Scott Fitterer is who we think he is as as a general manager and if he can continue to build this team with the 3-4 defense in mind. Tony, I wanted to turn to our old friend Jordan Rodriguez, who went on the Kyle Bailey show to uh, give her thoughts on Giro Rivera. I know Ajiro well, obviously covered him um, extensively here in Los Angeles and then kept up with him when he was in Denver. First and foremost, I mean, my goodness, this is an absolutely home run hire for the Carolina Panthers. And what I mean by that is not just Ajiro as a person, as a coach. Um, He's fantastic with players, fantastic with strategy, but it's a really modern hire too. This is the Carolina Panthers looking at the way that defenses are moving and changing and evolving in the NFL and what the dominant strains are going to be here moving forward. And Ajiro Evero is on the front lines of that. So the first thing I thought of when I see, you know, how hotly that the Panthers were pursuing Ajiro um, for, for, a, for quite a while, actually, um, I thought to myself, wow, this is a team that, that's modernizing fast in terms of what it wants to do with its scheme and philosophy. And Ajiro, like I said, he's on the front wave of that. Um, just the, the way that he can take all of the different systems that he's worked in, but also meld it into this sort of next evolution forward of what this Sangio system is. You saw it happen. You know, he helped install it with Brandon Staley in the, uh, in LA in 2020. And that kind of took over the league by storm. And now he continues to even move it forward. And it's very player first. It's very empowering to the players to play in a system like that. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, Kyle, I'm kind of excited to see what this thing looks like. Carolina. Yeah, this is uh, exciting to hear about. She's not the only one exciting. I think the continued the thing I go back to is his first year as a defensive coordinator um, is that how much this Broncos team defensive success came in the midst of dysfunction on offense. And that is very hard to sustain. I don't care what the talent level you have. You saw him uh, dealing with injuries, trade away, is the, but the team – produced and they're in a league they're in a division the only times here if you look at this this is wild actually i'm gonna share this just because i pulled this up the other day because i was just when just learning about him and i've got to learn more about the broncos you know what i'm saying like well that's who we should be kind of studying in a way yeah. look at these uh now i know you guys are going to look at the or at least i just remember the broncos just sucking on offense right I do remember that. But look at this. 17 Seahawks, 9 Texans, 10 49ers. Uh, they allowed 32 against the Raiders. Uh, I mean, now, now they played some bad teams in the beginning. Uh, the Jets, the but they hold the Chargers to 19 in October. Uh, they held the Jaguars to what 17. What was the score when we played them? Uh, when we played them, uh, yeah. 23-10. And see, um, even even then, this actually mentioned earlier, Tony, this defense was having to kick in overtime to make up for that putrid Denver offense and Russell Wilson stinking up the joint. They so, gave up over 30 points, only one, this 51, bur- but I don't think they had anybody. Play. I don't know what that was. Remember that game where the Rams put up? It was that. Uh, oh, that was all. I think that was all the off the Rams defense. Wasn't that Baker Mayfield involved in the 51 point game, the 50 burger on, on Christmas day. I think that was, uh, but, but uh, look, is this is, I mean, you're talking about the only time they gave up over 30 points was to the chiefs and they're in the super bowl. If you exclude that. So to me, that says a lot, that says a lot. And uh, one of the things that I continue to go back with with this hire is that while he is a young and exciting defensive coach, he has 15 years of NFL coaching experience. The other thing that uh, we also brought in uh, right now, one of the hires we don't know in his official capacity of what he is going to be with the Carolina Panthers, but we brought in Deuce Staley. Deuce Staley was... um, you know, I think parted ways in a good way with uh, Detroit. The word that I've heard is that his mother is ill and yeah. he's from South Carolina, I believe, or somewhere in the Carolinas. 
And uh, this would have been a good fit coming back home. I think there might be some correlation if him with him and Frank Wright at their time in Philadelphia. So, like, there's some potential relationship go- going back into the well he- there. But if you look at even just the Staley, the Evero, Campin, Tabor, this is the one thing uh, that I, what I found interesting. The problem facing a guy like a Matt Rule coming from the college ranks is not just a transition from college to the pros and how things are done, but your relationships are all built uh, if through the college system. So the guys you can call up, the guys you could call in a pinch and ask for advice, the guys that you ask to bring in your staff or whatever, they're all college dudes. Guess what Frank Reich is not? He is a pro dude through and yeah. through and through, and this staff already is showing you this. It's got the pro pedigree. And I don't know if this isn't just us putting a staff together that's good or if this is a symbol that Frank Reich has just had a long history in the NFL and he can go to the well. His name, his co- his contacts carry a bravado or a um, – not bravado, that's not the right word. Uh, they command a respect that the college yeah. name, you know, and this is like ever look, look at this is that Sean Payton is taking over the Broncos. Supposedly the Broncos wanted to retain Evero. And he said, man, I just really would like a fresh start. And, and then he comes to him? Carolina. Yeah, supposedly man. supposedly he chose Carolina over the Vikings. He chose Carolina over the Broncos. Clearly. I think fans were mad too. This has to be somewhat of Frank Reich's, you know, um, I don't know, the, the attractiveness of him. And can I be a little bit controversial right now? Please. I know we're, I know we're going to talk about Steve Wilkes. And, I, you know, I would have pulled for Steve Wilkes. But this is why Frank Reich was the better hire of the two. I agree. Between Frank Reich and Steve Wilkes. And, you know, we're going to talk about Steve. He's gone on to greener pastures, you know, and he kind of failed up, you know, since he failed to make the playoffs. Now he's, you know, he's gone on to a very good opportunity for him. But it's what you mentioned, Tony. Frank Reich has the type of pedigree where people can already see what he's building over here. They see how good our offensive line was. They see how... We have listen, regardless of what you and I think of the Panthers defense as Panther fans, the the thought around the NFL is that the Panthers have a lot of really good young defensive players to build around and that they're a few pieces away from being a top defense in the NFL. We're not used to it, but the Panthers right now are one of the premier destinations because of Frank Reich. And because of what we're doing here in Carolina. Love it. Love it. Uh, the number's 252-228-5098. That's 252-228-5098. We want to hear your thoughts on uh, the early phases of the Carolina Panthers assembling their staff. The Super Bowl's coming up. Cody, why don't we go ahead and jump into a couple of cat calls? Let's do it. So what are your thoughts on catcalling? Yeah, it's pretty You shouldn't do that to somebody. And how did that make you feel? Uh, very uncomfortable. So how do you think catcalling makes the person feel? It and feels two, good. Like... C3, what's up? No, I'm an old Panther fan here. Uh, great hire with Evero. I mean, I'm, I'm being optimistic about it because he had a lot of head coaching opportunities and interviews, so hopefully he sticks around for more than one year. Um, but it gives us a window where we can uh, operate and hopefully uh, achieve greatness in the South. Um, one other side note I will say, I think – if Frank Reich is going to be calling the plays, then, I mean, wouldn't the quarterback's coach be? 
2023 wasn't a good year for the Carolina Panthers, but I'm trying to make 2024 a better one for myself. Get started on your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including keto options, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Skip that overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door, and they're ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Head to factormeals.com slash C350 and use the promo code C350 to get 50% off. That's code C350 at factormeals.com slash C350 to get 50% off. Oh, it cut out. Am, am I the only one not hearing him? I don't not hearing him anymore. But Tony stepped away from the computer for a second. So whatever, it's just your boy talking. Um, shout out to the caller. Appreciate you, man. Um, listen, I I've said and been very vocal before. I would love to finally have a coach who is calling plays, a head coach who calls plays. Uh. And I, I think that that's, uh, that's important. And that was one of the bigger reasons why we even hired uh, Frank Reich in the capacity that we did. Hey, Tony, the call shit out halfway through. Oh, sorry. Hey, I can't, I, I can't sorry. hear you. All right. All right. I'm back. Uh, no, because I'm muted myself. That's why. But don't Can do you that. hear me now? Yes. All right. Well, that his call it went on for it says three minutes, but it turned out it was only forty five seconds. Here, let's go to Chuck. Hey guys, Chuck from Elizabeth City, aka Carolina Sports Guy. Yeah, Chuck. Uh, with everything going on like it is, and I know we're probably waiting on the Super Bowl to finish up so we can name our offensive coordinator, <clears throat> Brian Johnson. Uh, but anyway. I guess one of the questions I've got now that we've got a head coach and the defensive coordinator and the staff taking place, it really opens up the one thing that we definitely need. We know we got places, uh, pieces on defense and got a nice young offensive line. We need to build depth and, uh, got some nice pieces, receiver tight in here and there. You know, the running game don't look bad. The quarterback's a big question. Um, now. If we sell the farm, try to move up in this draft to get, I say, C.J. Stroud. Cause oh, I, why'd you do this to us, Chuck? He's the one to get, uh, and, and not Rice Young. Uh, you know C.J. Stroud. And I don't want Levis and uh, Richardson. I just, I know if we stick at nine. But I, I think Stroud would be the one home run pick. If we did trade up, we got to give up some assets. And that's my question. I'm kind of torn because if we do that, if we go with our new defensive coordinator and he does a 3 4, we've got some nice pieces in place like Brian Burns, Jeremy Chin, you know, JC Horn, Frankie Lulu. But we've got in, in there at Brown, but we got a couple people that like, you know, YGM that might not fill that void, might not be able to play that role. Um, so. My question is, if we give up a lot to get this quarterback, are we going to have enough ammunition left to replace or rebuild what we do need to on defense? Because if we keep these extra picks, we might be able to hit some defensive gems to, you know, carry on what this defensive coordinator we got from Denver, what he might be able to do. Uh, but then again, that puts you at risk of not really having that great quarterback. So that that's just the thing I want to pose. What what do you think we guys do? Do we go up a lot to get shrouded, or um, do we stay put and see what happens and uh, 
try to roll with Corral or, or maybe a, a, a their car or some other option and uh, keep these draft picks and try to get some defensive players, maybe another receiver. It's just something I'm kicking around because we could go any way. We don't really know what our our, our brass or our, our people in the office plan on doing yet. And that, that's what makes this time of year interesting. So I uh, can't wait for your comments, guys. This drives me nuts. Oh, pfft. Dude, you better get used to it, brother. This conversation is not going away until it's April. It's not the trade up problem. It's not that that drives me nuts. The uh, what drives me nuts is that we're potentially in a position where people are even considering trading up and doing all of this. Yeah. And in the background is a concern that our defense doesn't have enough depth. When all we've tried to do for the last two and a half years, three years, is is try to fix the defense. How is it not? All right, that's it. That's all I guess is like, well, you know, is that like if there was a time that you should be able to go out there and have these defensive players coming in and stepping into their own, uh, this would be a great opportunity. But names like I don't know, uh, YGM names like. Troy Pride Jr., names like, uh, I don't know, like we could go down the list of some of these defensive talents that we thought were going to be good and just kind of fizzled or aren't it. So that's it. That's what disappoints me. Well, look, now go to the trade talk. Well, look, man, you know, everybody knows I'm a Matt Corral fan, right? I would like to see what we have in Matt Corral. But I'm also a realist. And I know where there's smoke, there's fire. And the Panthers have chosen to not use a top 10 draft pick on a quarterback for the past, you know, three years in a row now when we've had an opportunity to do so. So with that said, I think that there's something to be said for just not prolonging the inevitable. And I've got to say, man, I kind of think that we might need to get used to the fact that the Panthers are probably going to be looking to trade up for a quarterback. Now, I went on Twitter today, and I put out a poll. If the Panthers traded up to number one, who should they draft? Not who will they draft, but who should they draft? And Tony, it used to kind of be the consensus that Bryce Young was the number one guy in the quarterback class this year. But, man, with over 646 votes, C.J. Stroud with a whopping 70.7% of the vote. And, man, listen. Why do you think it's changed so much? Well, you know what? He's a lot bigger than Bryce Young, probably by like five inches and about 30 pounds maybe. Um, five inches that's crazy <laughs> yeah i mean a yeah lot. i mean from from yeah he's he, he's a bigger guy i yeah. think they're they're relatively the same type of mobile in that you're not going to use them to run primarily but i think they're every bit as mobile as say a joe burrow is joe burrow is not a super mobile guy but Neither he can move Pat around Mahomes. when he is right right so in my mind cj stroud is more in that frame. And look, I'm not going to lie to you, man. CJ has one of the nicest touch passes that you're going to see on film from any of the quarterbacks this year. You know, and plus, if you remember, uh, his final game of the season, he came within three points of defeating the national champions. The yeah, Georgia like Bulldogs. if that goes a different way, they go. Yeah, to he's probably yeah, unanimous. He's like consensus number one. number one at this point. Yeah, so a lot of people. I mean, C.J. Stroud is the name that's on the tip of Panthers fans' tongues right now, and um, I don't you gotta know. Got to go I've, to number one. I've kind of come. The around only way to, to get him is to go to number one. <sighs> it's you a cannot, so rich, though. You man. cannot uh, believe if you feel that way that the other teams who are ahead of you in the draft are going to go, you know what? We just want to play the guy that's going to get us there, like be more consistent now 
let's go with the safer Bryce. You're not going to do that. They're going to pick. He's going to go number. He's going to be the first quarterback off the board. So then are you talking that we should trade up to number one? And say that. I'm saying that's what you have to do. We're going to have to give up a lot because let me tell you what, if the Colts decide that they want to move up, they're closer to number one than we are. Right. So There's if like we're three gonna, teams that could move up that are closer. And Tony, this is what I've been arguing with people online. People are like, oh, it's not even going to cost that much. You're it's delusional. You yeah, are out if you, don't, if you don't think that this is three first cost round picks, an arm and a leg for the Panthers to move up, you're delusional. I don't give a damn about what the Philadelphia Eagles gave to the Browns in 2016 when they drafted Carson Wentz. It will be far more than that. I am telling you. So there is no way, love, Cody, that it's less than this. Is that at the very minimum, it's this year's first, next year's first, and then a boatload of twos and threes kind of sprinkled in like this year's two next year's two and you know whatever i really truly think though to move from nine right we're at nine to one where there's three other teams ahead of you that also want quarterbacks you have to give the max and the max is three years ahead of time you're giving this year's first next year's first and the following year's first and tony now this is why i have the problem with the draft class, because whenever people hear me say that I don't want to trade up, you know, I, it's not that I wouldn't like a CJ Stroud or a Bryce Young. But when I say that they're not the type of prospect that a Trevor Lawrence or a Justin Fields were, that's what makes it all the hard that we're going to be having to give up this kind of draft capital. Why is he not a Justin up. Fields? I just don't think his he seems like he's just as good as Fields. How about except this? for I guess this the running part? He might. He's a better passer. That where he, he does he, seem he, to be a very good passer. I feel like Fields has better physical traits. Is there yeah, any little, fear that he's from Ohio State? And I know you don't like those arguments, but there's never been a tell me a good Ohio State quarterback too. Well, I hear you. But at the same time, all I can do is look at the route concepts and the type of throws that they ask CJ Stroud to make. And they he makes good. and, and he makes some big time throws, and those receivers are running an NFL route tree. So but I'm not really too are, concerned about it. And by the way, then I'll let you go. Uh CJ Stroud has taken snaps under center. So it's not like not a lot. I mean, though. Right, Every picture I see a man, from, he's in the shotgun. He's that was, he's, that's a great he's not point. he's not coming from a pure uh from a pure like RPO uh, system. Yeah, yeah. He's he's not he's not running that type of offense. And one thing I do know about him, they give him a lot of control at the line of scrimmage to be able to adjust his protection, uh, uh you know, make changes at the line. The the dude can do it all from a mental standpoint. They have too don't... good of talent at the receiving core for him to just be a one read or and tuck it and run type player. That's not even his right. game. So you're right about that. Cody, is are we when it comes to the Stroud talk, is it a little recency bias though? Uh and what I, I mean by that is the last couple of games, right? Like that game against Georgia, right? Just fucking sinking into our head. But if you think back to the beginning of the college season, he was, I think they went and played, who was it? It was a game I was like really excited to watch them play. And he was just whelming. It was like in these two big games. I don't know if it was the Michigan game or if it was, did they play Penn State? I can't remember if they played. I remember going, oh, this is a big matchup. We're going to watch this. This is the time Stroud is going to remind everybody that they've been sleeping on him because people told us two years ago Stroud is going to be the dude. People told us two years ago to not get last year's class with Pickett and them. That wasn't it. It's this year's class. So we were still waiting for it. And in the beginning, you know, you're like, oh, Stroud, his name kind of lagged through a lot of the season. He should be the number one prospect. Like he should have. He was kind of coming into the year, was he not? Who the yeah, hell was I mean, the hell? Yeah, I mean, well, like no, his, him and him and Bryce Young were the names. Everybody knew that those two dudes were going to be pretty highly 
considered in this year's draft class. Um, and it, it's not – how about this? It, it's not like Georgia was the only really good game that he played this year. Every game you watch, you will find clips – of CJ throwing these beautiful downfield passes with touch over the middle. The dude has the arm and he has the mind right. for it. Um, but, you know, something else to consider, he had Marvin Harrison Jr., the best wide receiver in college football. That's who I want. Jackson, Jackson Smith and Jengba, uh, who is another really good type of uh, uh, receiver. And Ryan Day, the play caller in their offense, he is just very good at scheming guys open. But at the end of the day, Tony, your quarterback can only do what they're asked to do. And they didn't ask him to run very much. And that's he's why not that's super fast, dude. I no, watched, he's not. I, he's watched not. Him. I was like, uh, I was expecting him to be like, oh, you're the guy taking over for Justin Fields. Like, uh, you're going to bet you he runs, I was like, nope. I bet you he runs like a four. Mac Jones. Like a like four, Mac Jones. Four, four, eight. Maybe a four seven. Oh, yeah, God, he's not. He's terrible. not. He's not really going to run away from you. But one of the reasons, telling you why people hype on that Georgia performance, is because it answered a lot of questions that people were wondering about him. How does he deal with pressure? Because pressure was a problem for him on film. It, you know, he doesn't really uh, run away from pressure that great. Sometimes he kind of he kind of drifts into the pressure rather than navigating the pocket and, and getting away from it. Whereas when he played Georgia, he played the best college defense that there is to be played. And he was doing all the things and checking all the boxes, moving up into the pocket, sure, sure. keeping his eyes downfield and using his legs as a runner to be able to run and get first downs in a big time moment in a big time matchup. So, Maybe it's recency bias, but that Georgia game is probably the most NFL type of defense that he played his entire yeah, college. Yeah, they're like always career. seven dudes. They're national champs. Um, and you know, here and recency bias is has a negative connotation to it. Is and if you could spin that and take it from another angle, is this just the fact that he peaked at the right time? as he peaked at the time that's going to help his draft stock the most. You know, his name is surging as Bryce Young's name was at the top in the pinnacle for all throughout. And then now people are, we haven't seen him play in a minute. Alabama didn't go to the final, to the national championship. So he's gotten a little distant in our minds. And guess what's become more important is height, height. You're like, oh, he's so small. He's so small. You know, too small. So, like, the tape that was overriding that now has faded while Stroud's tape towards the end of the season, you know, fanned the flames of his stock. And he's going to surge into the number one quarterback right now. And I don't think it's even close at this point, particularly. You guys ask me what I want to do. I think trading up to one from where we're at when the teams are ahead of, I just think it's going to be so much. Yeah. And you bet. I mean, he better be that's like Joe, Joe Burrow. Right. That's like, I mean, that's the type of player I need is a guy like I know is going to just like, I feel like Joe Burrow is just going to, as long as he don't get hurt, which he's already been hurt once, actually. It's like, as long as those, those guys are going to deal him, Mahomes. But I don't know. I mean, so much risk with it. My personal yeah. thought is, you guys are going to hate it. Bridge quarterback. Blech. One year, I know. And Hendon Hooker in the second. Why even spend the second round pick? If you're going to okay. get a bridge, if you're going to get a bridge, go with Matt Corral as your number two. There's no reason to not have him there. No, Hendon Hooker. No what I'm just to... saying is this. You no, just don't make Hendon Hooker start. No, it's that the idea is that that guy just doesn't make it so Hendon Hooker doesn't have to start. You're just knowing this is Hendon Hooker would have been in this conversation if he wouldn't have gotten hurt. So you just oh, get yeah. in a – it's just that this is that are you willing to risk you don't have to trade at all and you still get him. And he could be just as good as Stroud, like as when it comes to like how the talent level. 
And the yeah, only he, the only red my, flag to some people is that he's 25. He's my QB three. Uh, I've got it, uh, CJ Stroud, Bryce Young, and then Hendon Hooker. I have him above AR and uh, Will Levis. And I about really this? like Anthony Let me Richardson ask you this too. And, yeah, yeah, man, but I think people are a little. Uh, I, that's the pro. They're all projects in their own right. And some and. and let me ask you it this way, and then we're going to go to the next topic because and then we got to get back into some calls too. Um, what's more of a risk to you? And I want the callers to weigh in on this. I want you in the chat to weigh in on this. Trading three first-round picks and getting Stroud, right? Is that more of a risk or and, – and is the reward alluring enough or is more of a risk – taking Hendon Hooker in the second, trying to get a Jacoby Brissett for one year and letting maybe Matt Corral even beat him out this, you know what I'm saying? Like what's the bigger risk and is the reward that much different? I mean, no, but I mean, I'm a big fan of Matt Corral and I understand people aren't going to love this, but I, I absolutely think that Matt Corral is comparable from a physical talent perspective and a leadership perspective to all the quarterbacks in this draft. I really do. But I understand the argument that you're not going to bet your, and, and, and I understand the argument that you're not going to bet your future on, you know, a third round quarterback that these coaches didn't even hire or that sure. they, they, they didn't even draft. Uh, so, you know, I, I understand the, the urgency, but I put this on Twitter too. If the Bears know that the Panthers are desperate for a quarterback, they're going to drive up the price. And I'm sorry. I see people like Zach. Well, they also know that Houston wants one, too. It's not even the Bears knowing we're thirsty. That's not the point, Cody. Everybody knows every QB needy team is thirsty. The problem is this, is that if it gets into a bidding war, right? if you get into a bidding war, the other people's picks – they have more ammunition are more desirable. They're, they're higher up. And yeah, I mean, so that's what I'm saying, man. And I see people coming at me in the chat. Oh, it's a poverty mindset. We have to do what, whatever it takes. I'm sorry. I'm not jumping on the bandwagon of literally whatever the bears want for the first pick. The Panthers need to jump up and down and make it happen. Like I'm just, I don't, well, they I don't just know, have man. to give more than every other team. That's it. They don't have to jump up and down to make the Bears. A lot. That's going to yeah. be a lot. It's a gun to, in, in your mind, is there any way? And, yeah, you already said earlier, it's probably going to be three first round. That's what I think yeah. it has to be. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't see another world in which that isn't the scenario. Now, people are also saying, well, you would then have your – for what you lost in the draft, you would be able to make up with free agency. If you have your old line – you have your quarterback. Maybe you could convince some other guys to come. You don't here. got $70 million to spend, though. You don't even have that much. Uh, I mean, unless uh, unless they can do some. Uh, I mean, I think it's next voodoo. year. They're saying now it's going to take a whole nother year to get past this right now to where, like, yeah. we're, I mean, I, so I don't know if there is a super cap voodoo that we can do. Right now, the Chicago Bears, a lot of these teams have so much cap money, too. So they're going to be out there spinning in free agency, you know. Yeah. So you can't get in two bidding wars. But that—that's what I'm saying, Imagine dude. That. So that and look, I'm going to be very real with a lot of y'all in Panther Nation. Y'all are acting like some thirsty thoughts. Okay, everybody is so thirsty for a quarterback that most have adopted the mindset: whatever it takes to go get CJ Stroud, go up and get him. And, dude, I like C.J. Stroud. I just spent the past 10 minutes telling you all the things that I like about him. But if yeah, you're going to tell me that he's worth giving up three first-round picks and potentially ruining our draft for the next three years, I'm sorry. That's a hard sell for me, How man. much you got to think of it as this. is Who does the player that he compares to in ceiling and talent? Not a style of play, but... Think of some names like here. Let's use. Can I, can, uh, how about this? Can I give you a high end and a low end comparison? So, okay, okay this is a high end, low end. 
high end, you're hoping that is Joe Burrow. That high end, that's what you're hoping from CJ Stroud. Low end, maybe a Jared Goff. And Jared Goff had a damn good dude this year for yeah. the Lions. But, you know, that type of player. They're going to put the ball in the air. They're not very mobile. You're not going to ask them to do a whole lot. But, you know, in that kind of mold. You almost wonder, like, I want you guys in the chat to make a list of players that were worth three first-round picks as a quarterback. Like, I think you would put Luck in there. And even though, and and the irony of that is that he didn't – he retired before everybody, but like thinking back on even the best quarterbacks, the best prospects, sometimes they haven't yielded. Not sometimes they don't yield as much as you think. Like, um, I mean, is that, yeah. I mean, you're going to point to Joe Burrow. Maybe you could say he's worth three first round picks. You could say like an Andrew luck. You could say Patrick Mahomes. Now that you know what you know, um, uh, you could say maybe Trevor Lawrence, I get not maybe, I know you guys say that because he's been, he was like the most accomplished player in the history of the world or one of them. So I, I would accept his name in that. I'm trying to think of another name right off the bat that would just be, think about it in any scenario worth three first round picks. Like yeah. another quarterback, like that that we know. Yeah, I mean, like I mean, you can go back as far as you want to go back. Herbert, I said probably would have been worth three first round. Pick. That's crazy. But Justin you know Herbert, we could have just given one and gotten him. We only had to move up two spots. It hurts my soul that Justin yeah. Herbert okay. is not a. Panther. Let's. Uh, I want you guys to in the chat call in at two five two 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 eight fifty ninety eight. Tell us a quarterback that was is actually worth three first round picks um, outside of Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow at this point, Cody, let's get back into the show right now. Uh, I think related to the Carolina Panthers next is that as Frank Wright uh, was hired for the Carolina Panthers position, a lot of Panther fans were upset, dis- dis- disappointed. And I know that Steve Wilkes himself was disappointed that he didn't get the head coaching job amidst a very admirable um, kind of final fight uh, uh, by this kind of impromptu general that had to step in and Steve Wilkes. Steve Wilkes, that was headed to San Francisco, um, and you got to be happy for him this, is at least my man is going to a job where there looks like from the outside – uh, at this point, we don't know how the roster will transition over the short term, but they're going to, he's going to a really good team with a very talented defense. So, Tony, I, I've said it like this. In the NFL, there are two jobs that I imagine are more coveted than any other job. It's the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs, and it's the defensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers. And, and if you pay attention to the last – two years for the 49ers, they have produced two head coaches that you know have head coaching jobs right now. Robert Sala with the Jets, uh, then D'Amico Ryan stepped up. Now D'Amico Ryan's is the head coach for the Houston Texans. And listen, I'm just happy for him, man. And I've I've said this, you know, earlier. I would have loved for Steve Wilkes to be our head coach. I think Frank Reich was the right move. But, you know, not everybody's religious, but to those, you know, uh, who do believe in God, there's a saying, uh, when God closes one door, he's waiting to open a bigger, better one. And I know that that's what happened for Steve Wilkes. There's a bigger and better door opening up in his life. And now he gets the opportunity to, you know, finally uh, have a plethora of different talent to be able to do is that 49er defense is absolutely loaded. And I mean, I think this is going to be his best opportunity, perhaps even better than it was with the Panthers to finally land that head coaching job in the NFL at some point down the road. I love me some Steve Wilkes. I'm so happy for what he did for the Panthers this season that he got to be a part of that. I mean, he made that season more fun for us, Tony. In the years that we've been doing this show, 
the end of this past season was better than the past four years combined of late November Panther football. So I love him. I'm happy for him. And I, I wish him the best. I think this is the perfect opportunity for him. Uh, he didn't get the job in Carolina, but he cost us a first round draft pick. If we trade up into the spot that you guys want him to is Steve Wilkes came in here and he made it more expensive for us to trade up by making us relevant by winning a few games and giving us a little heart and soul at the end. And it does help us. And what I mean by that is like, man, well, guys think before the day before Steve Wilkes took over this team, we were talking about this is here we come. Number one, here we come. Number one draft pick. And now we're having to talk about trading three first round draft picks to get the number one, which is um, how have we fallen or have we risen? I don't know. It's like what upside down world you want to look at it from the other thing. The thing I'm most happy about Steve Wilkes getting this job uh, is I'm finally happy that he's going to have a defense that he doesn't have to blitz every down to get pressure. And <laughs> right. When That's he was our defensive coordinator, he only did one year as our defensive coordinator, and it was a pretty admirable job he did. The defense wasn't as great. I mean, you know, we were coming from the 2015 to 2016 season. Uh, Tony Ely took over full time, didn't work out. So he didn't have uh, the pass rush that you had where you kind of had. Um, what was it Jared Allen who came in? We traded for him. Char- uh, I think Charles Johnson. Yeah. So you had some talent on that, that that you didn't have in 2016. And I just remember he blitzed at a rate higher than like any coach. All right. Like we were just blitzing like crazy. And it Dude, was I, not because he I wanted don't, to. He I just don't remember. Had to. I don't even remember a Panthers team that blitzed as much as that team. Yeah. They, they, we were, we but were he's now going to get to be a balanced coordinator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy for Steve, man. I'm happy for Steve. Two things can be true. He did the best job for us that he reasonably could have done, and I think that Frank Reich was the right guy for the job, man. I'm happy. Particularly if you're talking about trading up and picking a quarterback and this and that, is that you have to think we're a little bit more well positioned to make that decision, not just us being fans on the outside looking at it, but having a quarterback at, who is a former quarterback who is now your head coach who is just starting his tenure, who's coming off of kind of that bridge but not uh, bringing in the, the young guy to make it a bridge part. We're better suited to make the decision if we should pull the trigger on a quarterback than it now with Frank Wright than we would have been with Steve Wills. Yeah. Also, you know, if we're going to get the quarterback too, uh, I don't mean to backtrack, but trading up in the first year of your head coach's tenure is also kind of a rough thing, right? To then be hamstrung and then not having your first round pick after your first year in the NFL. I don't know. That's just kind of tough, but um, I don't know, man. Like I said, I'm happy for, yeah. I'm happy for Steve and uh, you know, I, I, I'm excited to see what this new Panthers team is going to look like because it feels like on offense and defense, we're finally making changes uh, that are going to be, you know, the first in our history for the Panthers. All right. What we got next? Uh, so if you're on Twitter, like us all the time, um, you know, you might know that Twitter is for bullshitting, right? Going on there flying off the seat of your pants, saying whatever you want to. But sometimes as fans, we forget that Pan- that the Panther players, they go on Twitter too, man, and they see the stuff that people type. So um, Shaq Thompson, my man was on one. My man was, uh, he had time. He had time. He was going after some people that uh, he felt were kind of misrepresenting him saying that he needed to be cut, his cap casualty. And there's a lot of interesting conversation behind this. And, you know, even thinking about what does Shaq Thompson's role look like now with the Carolina Panthers, if we do move to a true 3-4 type of defense 
and you have Frankie Louvre who's come on, and you have Brandon Smith, and you're probably going to draft another linebacker. Then on top of that, Tony Shat Thompson's cap hit is probably going to be around $23 million this year. It's He's a lot of bro. money, man. So he was going, you know, people were talking shit on Twitter, and then he decided he wanted to, you know, he wanted to speak his mind. And a lot of people were saying that he was wrong for not being at the press conference when they hired Frank Reich. That's well, what started this, actually. Right. Someone said that, and I forgot. I didn't get that tweet. But uh, and it's called. I think he's he's very active in Panthers Twitter. I think it's a dude. I think he has a name. It's called Chub in a Tub. Uh, he ended up apologizing, which is I think was nice his stand up. But he, you know, you read into everything. He's like the leader, the so called leader of the team. Now he does have a point in that, not this, but like he has been the centerpiece of Panthers yeah. leadership, whether he wanted to be or not over the rule era, you know? So he, he yeah. is the guy that's like the tenured vet who has taken a vocal role, but they were like, Oh, he can't, he, he won't even at this press conference. So, and then, and he's overpaid, cut him. That's like it, where it went. And uh, then he responded to that. And he was like, I was taking care of, it said something like my women's and sick kids or something. Yeah, I was he like, said that, how many he, women you got? You got to take care of. It's like he said harem. that he was taking care of sick women. And hey, man, shout out to him for being a good dad, being a good right. man. But it's not okay. This is the thing. It's not unfair, right? Pan- Panther fans are going to speak their mind on Twitter, okay? And it's not a shot that he's twenty three million dollars against the cap and then he you know he goes on to say nothing's going to change my mindset it's a business at the end of the day no hard feelings whether i'm here or not i'm a root for this team and my brothers best believe i'm gonna be here we can work something out would you take a pay cut at your job now i don't know but that you you can kind of take that two different ways because those last two sentences are kind of at odds with each other we can work something out, but would you rather take a pay cut at not your at job? Odds. I kind of feel like odds. if you can work something out, that means you're willing to do something with your contract. He wants to restructure. He's- He'll restructure, but that still fucks us, man. Here's the thing. At the yeah, end of the day, he's the just over. The road. Not over. Yeah. His pay, he's well compensated for his production. The Panthers have well compensated him. He does is this is that that contract is heavy on our salary cap right now. And I'm not going to fault my man for making money. Right. So I'm not going to say he should take a pay cut. Like, I don't think that's it is at the end of the day is this is we just wish, man, we're four years into this contract and it's still this heavy. No way out of it. Like there's no way out of it. Like, you can't even restructure, and and then when you restructure, that just adds years. So then, what's the answer here, Tony? Do we cut him? Do we trade? The real him? ideal thing what would we be do? to trade. Because somebody brought up this is, and I and I looked into the Derek Carr stuff a little bit more. Um, because I him. like I like Derek. I I think that would be a good. Like if you, I think even if you got CJ Stroud, you'd still get Derek Carr on a one-year deal with Frank Wright. You're pretty good this year. And then CJ Stroud takes over next year. That's what I would do. And I don't know if it would work or not. But I was looking at this is that when you trade for Carr, you can't trade for Carr right now. Because when you trade for him, you get the deal that he's on, the base salary. They have to pay the guaranteed money, but you get the base. And he's going to get paid his base salary next year is $32 million. And it's like that, you know, that's just start money. It's like, and when you think about it with Shaq, that's the thing is that like the only way that we're going to offload that salary and you're still going to eat the, whatever the guaranteed is, is to trade them. And then, so you have to find another team that would, what team would take on sack, uh, sack, sack, sack Thompson. How old sack is Thompson. Now? He's all, I think someone said he was 25. There's no way he can only be no. 25. I'm about to look it up. 
But the thing is this, they have to pay whatever that number is. So we're just going to have to pay Shaq. Like we're in a tough spot. So I think the thing almost to do is just suck it up, pay it this year, and then get a hell out of it the next no, year. No, he's 20, he's 28 years old. Okay. So listen, a lot of people are saying, not oh, that you, old, but he's not you, that good either. And I hate right, to say that. That sounds so mean, angel. but he is whelming, bro. He is the official de- definition of whelming. He's not overwhelming. He's not underwhelming. He never lived up to what Thomas Davis was able to do at the same position. You know, um, you can even argue that Frankie Luvu, as an outside linebacker, what uh, has been better than Shaq Thompson in certain facets, just because yeah, of how totally. aggressive he is, how fast he is. People in the chat room are saying um, you could re-sign him to uh, to an extension to alleviate the cap hit. But I don't know, man. Like it just seems like right now the ethos is to be young and fast on defense, and I don't know that Shaq Thompson is necessarily either of those things. I don't right? know if he. Like, how about this? Is do you think he's got to be considered an old twenty eight? He's been playing a lot of football, bro. He's been playing a lot. Yeah. I mean, like he hasn't been a star the whole time, but it's not like he's getting faster. And right now, you're not looking at him at 27 years old blowing away people with speed. How's he going to get faster next year? How all of a sudden is he going to get a renaissance at 30 years old? That's not going to uh, – it doesn't seem likely for that to happen. You know, Can you have a renaissance when you never had a first birth, right, in in that yeah. sense? Um, speaking of Frankie Louvu, now that you bring his name up, he might be the most exciting the guy to see what uh, the uh, Giro Evero can do with. Yeah, dude, Luvu's a beast. Like that man. might be the type of player that would work in that transition to where all of a sudden now he's like going to be a house. He could potentially be a household name. I mean, I want to see what we have in Brandon Smith. And listen, how about this? I feel like Frankie Luvu, based on what he was able to do last year. Number two in sacks on the team, by the way. I feel like he's more important to the Carolina Panthers right now. And what, he's been on the team two years now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, Luvu never, I mean, uh, Thompson, in my own opinion, never had that kind of jump. And we're, not, okay. and, and we're not we're not shitting on him. And granted, I even said that when he uh, wore that number seven, I felt yeah, like he like played he got better. There. Yeah, he's he had, had a little, some moments. He had some, he's had some moments. I yeah. uh I'm also a victim of, you know, like you just want to be right about things. Um so like I I I'm I admit that I hold a little grudge to Shaq Thompson because I got so on board with the pick when we made it and it was like uh I think it was a 2015 pick yeah. or something like that. Went to the and like I mean think about where we were at, you know what I'm saying? We had just 2013. Like I was just feeling good and he, it was pitched to me, Shaq Thompson. They talked about Shaq Thompson the way you used to talk about Isaiah Simmons. Right? It's just like, oh, he's so versatile. He could do, you know, like he's yeah, just he an athlete. Like three different he was a positions. baseball player. Yeah. He was, you know what I'm saying? It's like all of that. They played him at Buffalo Nickel. So you were so excited about it. Bought his jersey before he even played a snap. And it's just been, he's been, uh, he's been, all right. Um, I love Shaq, but it's time to move on. Think about I, these I'm, names. I'm, you know. Ejiro Evero, Frankie Luvu, and let's go get Jimmy Ward. You want to talk about that? That's a 30-year-old safety who I think is more could be a big addition at free safety for this defense. That's who I want. That's my – my. go ahead. I'm dropping that name. What else do we got after Shaq Thompson bantering? Not bantering. That's messed up. Oh, ugh. This one got uh, Panther fans riled up today. Uh, the uh, Hassan Reddick. Look, somebody said somebody said this in the chat. Tony, that's the first thing you good. The first good thing you said. Hey, we've been on air for a ten, oh, an hour and fifteen minutes. I finally said something good. Uh, yeah, Hassan Reddick. How about this? Hassan Reddick, uh, you know, I, this is fun about the Super Bowl is you get so many stories. They spend so much time with the media and you get so many kind of, they they open up a little bit about some different things. 
Hassan Reddick was asked about his exit from Carolina and joining the Philadelphia Eagles as a free agent. And he said, oh, you, want, you want to play the video? Yeah, yeah, I think that'll be fair. I'll let you guys draw your conclusions about this, and we'll argue about it. After your success in Carolina, what made you want to test the free agency market again? After your success in Carolina, what made you want to test the free agency market? It, it, uh, it wasn't that I wanted to test free agency. Uh, Carolina just had other plans and other directions that they wanted to go to. Go, go for it. So what do you uh, mean? He didn't want make to test. Free. He didn't want to test free agency, but the Panthers no. had other directions that they no. wanted. I don't think that that no. is how I read it at all. Like when he said he didn't want to test free agency, it didn't mean that this is that he didn't mean like oh I cared about like I like I was opposed to uh of testing free agency. I was wanting to stay in Carolina. I think he's just announcing this is he didn't say oh I want out. Like he didn't write the Carolina Panthers off as a potential suitor in free agency. He was hitting free agency regardless, you know, and the, I, what I'm just saying is this is I think he's trying to position himself is I didn't say no uh, to the date. Like it wasn't like he was like, I don't want to be in Carolina. I think that's what he meant there. I mean, no, I wait, say that last part one more time. That he just like his whole poor. I think all he's saying here is I did never said I didn't want to be in Carolina. That's all I think he's saying is like I never said that. It was like I wasn't. It wasn't off the table. But they they wanted me less. They didn't want me enough. That's all I would say. God of Blackness says uh, he wanted to stay, but Brian Burns fire. Uh, by the way, David Screws also donated said. Uh, Let's go Super Bowl staff with the two dollars. Thank you, David. Um, no, I have a problem with this, Tony. You and I are gonna have to be at odds once okay. more. Um, no, I think this is dumb. I think it was dumb that we decided to one let this man go, and then number two, sign Dante Jackson over Stefan Gilmore. And I was really happy with the Dante Jackson signing when it happened, but I think those were two high-end veterans, um, and especially Hassan Reddick. Hassan Reddick was playing his best ball the past two years. He was our primary pass rusher. He, he was snubbed for the Pro Bowl. Do y'all remember that? Hassan Reddick, damn well, it. He had he more sacks than Brian Burns, Bowl. and I think Br did yeah. Brian Burns make it last year? He made the Pro Bowl, so that's yeah. my point. You don't just let go, in my opinion, of players that want to be a part of your organization. And to me, this goes back. Remember when Matt rule said, Oh, you know, I thought it was a, a four year plan, a five year plan. I would have signed more free agents. If I would have known, Oh no, you only have one or two years. So in my mind, this is just our dumb fuck organization led by an absolute clown in Matt rule that let two of the more talented people on the roster, walk out of the door. It's insanity, man. That Eagles defense is loaded from top to bottom. And you can make the argument, Hassan Reddick is the best player on their defense. You didn't the disagree with me one. one bit, Cody. Yeah, you I didn't disagree. I'm not, I think you're not disagreeing with me. Easier, and the organization forced him out. I don't think that Hassan Reddick wanted to be anywhere where where the best deal wasn't. He just came off of 12 seed. Like, is this, is that he might, I don't care how much I want to be in Carolina if I'm him. If they ain't paying me what the Eagles can pay, then I ain't going to be there. And I think that's just what he's saying is this, is that it's not that I didn't want to be with the Carolina Panthers. They made their priorities, and I wasn't one of them. I now I don't that. don't you I think? and yeah I think this is well I don't know it's kind of hard it's easy to say this the yes, fact that the, we're paying Shaq and Dante instead well, of we him, already were paying hard. Shaq like that one doesn't get to count I will agree with the Dante on an even scale would I rather would we be better with Hassan Reddick or not the answer is yes clearly right but the idea is is how much 
would you have to make make him a priority to have actually gotten him last year? How would that have affected your ability to maybe pursue Austin Corbett? How would it have affected your ability to go after who was the other one we did? Um, didn't we get two linemen in free agency? Corbett oh, oh, and yeah. Bozeman. Corbett and Bo- Corbett yeah, and, Bo- and so like I mean, yes, in on the on paper, uh, like just yes or no. I thought Reddick, I was a huge Reddick fan last year. I loved him. He's like the most exciting thing about the team last year in so many ways. So, yeah, I would want him. Now, I tell you this is, would we be a better team right now if we had him for the next two years? And you, do you have, can you find a way to keep Burns? That tandem could be real good. You know, like there is, that defense would be a lot further ahead too if we had them, had him. Yeah, man. I mean, um, I, dude, every sucks. time I see him ball out, it hurts me on the inside, man. It really Dante does. was a risk. Dante was a risk. Is this? Yeah. Is he was cheaper than Stefan Gilmore? Shorter and more injury prone. Right, but he's more risky because of the. He's never played. He hasn't played a full season right. since his like rookie year. So you tried right. to get. You tried to hope that he was going to be healthy and get a a deal that was two or a year longer year and a half or two years longer than if you would have gotten Gilmore, right. You would have paid just as much with Gilmore on shorter time span. I mean, it was risky. This is the thing is you almost, and I've kind of learned this with fantasy football is you don't want to bet too much on somebody coming off of injuries. It's not that it doesn't happen. It's not that they can't be good. But a lot of times it takes a year longer than you want it to take. And betting on somebody that's coming off an injury, and Dante was coming off an injury the year before, it's just risky. It's like paying Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. And ultimately, uh, kind of what God of Blackness is saying here with another $5 love bomb, basically it was between Brian Burns and Hassan Reddick. And to having to be paying both of those guys, they felt that that was a bridge too far. But what, well, what if we don't pay Brian Burns though? Imagine that. Ah. You know, like I mean, that's assuming we actually pay Brian Burns. Here's the: how about this though? Is if you had to choose between one or the other, is like what is a better defensive t- a player to build around? Is Brian Burns a? easier to build around uh and is 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 reddick a good player like a great player on a a good defense and a good player on an okay defense because you have to remember too there's like seven their their defense is fucking incredibly talented but also, how like about it's this? not just him out there wrecking. They had 70 sacks this year. But listen, but no, no, but this is how I can counteract that. His final year with the Cardinals, he had 10 plus sacks. Then it comes to the Panthers, has 10 plus sacks. Then it goes to Philadelphia, and he has 15 sacks. It seems like no matter what you put him, what team you put him on, Hassan Reddick is a productive pass rusher, man. I'm telling you, my man looks like a baby Von Miller. He has that kind of athleticism, dude. And it's just so tough knowing that we let that kind of player walk out of the door, man. It's just tough. It Um, does. It sucks. I'm just excited to see him. Like, this is the type of defense he can fucking eat in, bro. Yeah, Look, they have. Look, they have three players in the secondary and Brad, Bradbury, Darius Slay, and now the whatever Chauncey Gardner, whichever the um, now yeah. I'm all getting confused with Sauce, who's from Chauncey the Gardner, Johnson. yeah Chauncey, which is he is a good player uh, that wouldn't be a terrible addition to the Carolina Panthers either. I mean, these are we're looking at free agency coming. He's hitting free agency, but that secondary allows them more time up front to get the quarterback. Yeah. Right. They have big boys in the middle. They, that's a type of defense that Hassan Reddick can just fucking go bananas in. But if you put him in our defense this year, he wouldn't have had 17 sacks. 
I mean, he would have had. Know, he could have had thirteen. No, nah, I mean, it's just. Like, I don't I feel know. Like How that, can you that's say the that, perfect though? spot. It's just he's such a compliment to where they are right now. Yeah, it but almost that, is like I'm, I'm rooting for him to be in that defense instead of seeing him waste away on a Carolina Panthers. Every single defense that he's on, no matter the talent around him, he ends up becoming the primary pass rusher on the Cardinals, the Panthers and the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't think that there's anything to him being a complimentary piece. I think he is a premier pass rusher in the NFL. And I think God of Blackness is right. The more the Panthers continue to look at the books, having two highly paid defensive ends, it was probably just too rich for them. And I don't know. We, 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 we made a mistake. One of the things that I said, I said earlier, Tony, Federer, his job has never been more important than right now we can't have any more of the panthers paying for players who don't put up the very highest level of productions no more playing or paying these middle of the pack players that are either hurt every year or they're good but they're not necessarily elite level players like no it's time to step our shit up and pay the very best of the best and right just now, don't sign I deals hold that too long. Just don't I, sign is... deals that are too long. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. The number is 252-228-5098. Let's go in back to the cat calls. See what we got here. Cover me for a minute. Yo, what's up, C3? It's JJ. Coming back at y'all with another call. You already know how I love calling you all. But I just remember how this past Friday, free for all, I mentioned, you know, Brian Burns is better than Hassan Reddick, and I'm going to stand on that um, because he plays the harder position. Um, even though maybe he was two back short from when they were playing on the same team, that doesn't necessarily mean Hassan Reddick was the better player. It just means he might have had the better or more productive season. That doesn't necessarily mean you're always the better player. but I mentioned Brian Burns made the Pro Bowl over Hassan Reddick. And another dude I, in, in the Friday Suits for All said Tyler Huntley made the Pro Bowl this year. Well, first of all, none of the initial Pro Bowl starters were going to the Pro Bowl for the AFC quarterback. But that's besides the point. All of us Panther fans know damn well the Carolina Panthers and their players get zero credit. They never get the recognition they truly deserve. They never. Who do. didn't get it? DJ Moore, Frankie Lou, J.C. Horn. They're mm. all underrated in comparison to the rest of the league. They never get that kind of credit. Oh, so yes. the one player who does get that credit, we're going to discredit him? I don't oh, know. Oh, Brian Burns. Is that in okay. the Friday Fraud. I think it might have been White Chocolate, but... No, bro. We're not going to discredit Brian Burns for his accomplishments and being the one player on our team that actually gets some recognition because he's a star in the making. Like, come on. Let's, let's show some respect. All right. Love the podcast, C3. You coach C3. I think the thing I take away from uh, that is that we don't have to disparage Brian Burns to compliment Hassan Reddick, and we don't no. need to disparage Hassan Reddick to compliment compliment Brian Burns. I do think this is that Reddick is one of those players that has overperformed, ac- exceeded his expectations at his last two stops here. And the Eagles. He has played. We got him on such a cheap deal last year, too. He was like nothing. He didn't cost anything. He played for us relatively for free in comparison to what he put up. He has outproduced guys. Um, but he's he's made his shit. Son Reddick's good. Son Reddick's good. I don't know. I'm not even in love with Brian Burns. I'm not even a super Brian Burns defender but I don't feel like I have to detract for me either. It's one of those guys like this is that like, I hate talking junk about the best players on my team. Yeah. You know, is that at the end of the day is that, yeah, I can talk junk a bit like his, but he's still like better than 
the yeah, other but we're also not 10 guys out there. <laughs> so one, we're not necessarily talking junk either. You know, we're talking about Redick and him moving on and what caused us to move on from him. But that meant that this season was even more impressive for Brian Burns, that he had a career high in sacks and literally every team that we went up against knew that Brian Burns was the only pass rush that we had. Tony, our second in sacks was Frankie Louvre at number five. So they, they were doubling, I, they were they were double teaming Brian Burns all the time. And Tony, how many years in a row now have we mentioned how many near misses Brian Burns has every season? Where if he's just one step closer or one step to the left or right on a certain particular play at a certain particular time, and he could have had another five sacks every single season. His potential is up with the very highest pass rushers in Who's, the NFL. Are you still Brian saying Burns. that? Are you I still do one thousand percent. Oh my god! I want that. I can don't I make think a, that. Can I have, make a controversial? I don't. I that? don't believe that. For example, T.J. Watt is some type of player that is just levels ahead. You're crazy. Of yes, Brian he is. Burns. I, I disagree. I disagree. His production alone, what he's already done has been levels above. And that's the conversation with Burns. A lot of people feel that he hasn't lived up to his potential. But he has gotten better every single year. Here's a hot take for you. Looking back at this year for Brian Burns, is it that much of a better year than he's had the last three years before it? Like you look yeah. back at that. Okay, so yeah, no, you're just gonna look at just the sack statistic only. And pressure. She was one of you the just top five. Of, look, just remembering back into this season. Do you think it was anything much better? Like significant. So you think his this past year he's like he- really stepped up in comparison? I think he was pretty good the first three years or whatever. Yeah, but this so year I would was say he's pretty far, good. He's I would say he was a little bit better this year. But again, when you add in all the other circumstances, he was our primary pass rusher, and it was a secret to no one. He was the guy, and yet he still put up as many sacks as he did. Imagine if the Panthers... I thought you said Luvu was the guy. But that's my point. That's a problem. If your outside linebacker in a 4-3 defense is number two on your team in sacks, that's an issue. Because that means it's nobody else on your defensive line. We're not getting enough pressure on the line. And when we do, it's always Brian Burns. This is jo- Joseph Broach. I'm with you. Joseph Broach. I, this is exactly it. Is that he's been ve- he's been good. He's been important to our team. I hate talking junk about the players who are actually the most talented on my actual team. But we are, as Joseph said, go back to that comment one back before, is we are going into his fifth season, and we're still waiting on potential. We're still waiting on the more to come, the Brian Burns to turn it on, as he points. Uh, Michael Igwe says he's already turned it on. Okay, so that's the turn it on, then. Is he at the, you know, uh, the close to the apex of his powers? Yeah, okay. so all, all right. by myself. All right, elite, elite. He is, I, and I've been asking this, do the Carolina Panthers have any, and I haven't asked it tonight, but do we have any superstars? And are you guys confident, those people that says he's already turned it on? I mean, are you confident that he is a superstar? Does he count, and is he classified as a superstar? Is he not getting the credit, as the caller was saying before, the Carolina Panthers not getting the credit. I think he's getting, I think the Panther fans give him plenty of credit. I think they give him plenty of grace and you guys keep telling me he's going to be the best. And I hope he is. I hope he is. And now, especially, and I hope he's the best as a Carolina Panther, because if we just let him walk and he becomes the best, then I'm going to be really fucking. How about this? Do you think that you've seen everything that Brian Burns is capable of? Do you think there's a better pass rusher in there or, is that incrementally? Just him? I just wonder if it's incrementally. No, is that like if that's my question is is can he be a dominant player? 
it's not just being a good pass rusher. It's about being like great in all phases. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, is that is sure is that it, can he get 15 sacks in a season? Yeah. But can he also be an every down defensive man who's not a lot like who is doing all the things? I don't know. Is that this? I would say he's been good. He has been very good. I don't know if I would say he has been. But like, what it, what do you classify as? Like, well, can he become the the star of the league, like a Von Miller level player? I don't know. That's pretty well, high. And, and and again, if we don't have a Demarcus Ware on this football team, there's no Nick Chubb on this football team opposite Brian Burns. And I like what Michael Igwe says here: top ten in sacks, top five in pressures, top five in tackle for losses. What else do you want him to do? It only doesn't okay. seem and and he played through injuries this year. So the only okay. reason why, why Brian Burns doesn't seem more impressive is because he's a one man army. Where he's a one man army. We're almost expecting too much of him. I agree. I, and I'm you, fine with that. But you guys line. keep telling me he's gonna be this like you guys, you throw names out like the Bosa's. It might as well call him be like, oh, he's almost he's gonna be what is this ceiling Miles Garrett? I don't think even that. even even Bosa, they have dudes on that team. True if, true. if 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 it's not Bosa, they're not yes, Bosa is their main pass rusher, but they are not dependent upon Bosa. The Panthers are dependent upon Brian Burns for a consistent pass rush. That's the difference. If any, yeah, the only pass rush. I agree with that one thousand percent. Yeah, one hundred. Um, I'm not sure. Tra- All right, uh, let's go to the next call. Yo, 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 yo. What it do, C three? Anthony from Charlotte. Hope y'all boys are having a good Tuesday. Um, what up, Anthony? Just a couple thoughts here. Uh, I didn't call in last week. Been really hella busy, but um. I want to get down to the business first. I want to congratulate Steve Wilkes for the DC job. Um, sure. I think this is a situation kind of like RDC. You know, he may leave after next year to get that head coaching position so we can get some draft compensation. Great coach. As you guys know, my opinion is on Steve Wilkes. I wanted him as the head coach. Um, so, yeah, so going on the quarterback and, you know, what's going on with the team right now, I'm one of those guys where I I, I personally I do want to trade up. I, I'm a big CJ Stroud guy and Bryce Young, but you know Bryce Young is my number one. But just based on what all the talk is right now and how he may fall in the draft, you know I I, I don't think he fits what Reich wants. Um, you guys talked about this last week with the height. And I think it really does mean a lot. Like, I, I don't think Reich wants a smaller QB. Um, so, yeah. So, if you're going to trade up, I hope it's C.J. Stroud. But if we don't trade up, I'm not going to be mad, man. You know, like, in my opinion, I am. Uh, I do like Derek Carr a lot. I think he's the definition of consistency. I think he's been with a trash organization. So, if Reich was to sign a QB, fine like a Derek Carr but this is where it comes in for me if you're going to sign Derek Carr you still need a backup option shout out to Tony he said this last week you know if if Reich's going to sell this to Tepper then there's got to be a backup plan for later down the line Carr's 32 so he's probably got like three good years left in my opinion three or four I still think you need to take a flyer on a QB. Um, I like all the hires we've made. You know, the DC, awesome, awesome hire for our scheme. And, you know, we'll get that offensive coordinator soon. But I think Reich's going to be calling majority of the plays, which I'm happy about. And I think that's part of the reason that he was brought in here, in case the OC doesn't know what he's doing in some situations, so Wright can take over if he has to. Um, but yeah, you know, those are my thoughts on the situation. Uh, it's draft season. I just can't wait for the draft. And yeah, man, uh, Anthony from Charlotte, give me y'all, y'all's thoughts on the quarterback position and 
you know, how you like the direction of this team going. Anthony from Charlotte, keep. Oh, unmute. Uh, the quarterback situation. Found can... it, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. The quarterback, great name, by the way. Uh, the quarterback situation will continue to dominate the Carolina Panthers discussion until it doesn't at this point. I mean, look, as we knew what we got up here maybe two or three weeks ago or a week, two weeks ago, Cody. And I was like, what do we, what, what do we talk about? And you were like, I mean, we, I wasn't saying like, Oh, we can't, I don't have no what anything to talk about. It was like, what else can we talk about is the head coach until we get a head coach. And then after that, the quarterback, after you get the head coach, like that's just the, it, everything else is going to be so dependent upon that. Um, and you're kind of wondering about that bridge quarterback. Uh, do you get a rookie? Do you trade up? All of these things that we've talked about a lot earlier. The thing, though, is that when I say a bridge quarterback, he was saying, good Lord, three and four good years. That must be the best case scenario. Think about this is Matt Stafford, who everybody thought is way better than Carr is already hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're like, they got a one and he's done in this way is that maybe he's not done, but that's how it almost feels. Cars out nowhere is complicated. I would be fine with it for like a year, but you would have to get Stroud too. Like, and I don't know, you can substitute any name here, but as I started to look even more into it, here's the problem. He's just fucking expensive, dude. And the the Raiders uh, have to trade him. And if they don't trade him, um, they're going to lose some money. But either way, Carr is going to get paid like $30 million. Oh, yeah. That dude's laughing all the way to the bank. Think uh, about that. $30 million. And he could be like another Sam Darnold here. Would you rather play with him this entire year or play against him this entire year? Because he's at, meeting with the Saints. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Rappaport says uh, the Saints invited quarterback Derek Carr for a visit, uh, and the Raiders have granted permission for that to happen. The plan is for a visit tomorrow. Carr has a no trade clause, is doing his due diligence, and no trade is imminent. Uh, when Dennis Allen was the Raiders head coach, he inserted a highly touted rookie into the starting lineup. In 2014, that player was Derek Carr. Um, You're going to hate me. Oh, all right, go ahead. Is that if this is for somebody who has actually been open to the, the idea of Carr being a quarterback for a team temporarily, honestly, I think I'd rather have Jameis Winston than him. And Jameis Winston's coming from the Saints. Like, you know what? If that's what we're going to do, if we're just going to bring in a guy to get us through a year, fuck paying Derek Carr $34 million at this point. Give me unintentionally funny, the most funniest person in the world, Jameis Winston. Is Jameis Winston any less of an accomplished quarterback than Derek Carr? And I would say no. He just throws more picks. I would say Derek has probably reached higher highs, but really? if you're uh, even if you're even making that comparison, that's, that's what, yeah. how you yeah that's right. how you know it's the wrong move in the first place. Yep. Right? I would rather play against Derek Carr than to play with him on my team. Um, I don't know, man. He doesn't do it for me, dude. I, I feel like I have seen Derek Carr in big moments shit the bed almost every single time. In the biggest moments, he'll throw these dumb interceptions like right to the defender. Uh, he's not very mobile, so he's going to be very dependent upon the protection. And I know every quarterback Here's is. Here's where I but, challenge you, know. you on that. Here's where I challenge you on that is you haven't seen him make big mis mistakes in big moments. He ain't even been in big moments. That's the real problem is, yeah, he's done those in moments, but like they have been irrelevant for his entire time that he has been the quarterback. They've had what is way just going to become relevant now. They've almost, they've made the playoffs before and he has come close. He's never had a playoff. playoff. Uh, yeah. But yeah, when they played the chargers, uh, I believe it was last year. No, was, they did. Oh, uh, did, did they make the playoffs last year? Came down to the last game of the season between them and the chargers. Right, and they did the stupid thing where they, they could have tied and they both, well, not the stupid thing, but they they just went ahead and won it. 
Has he ever had a playoff win? Um, no off way. Top of my head, I don't believe so. They've been irrelevant. So as I agree with your point, I'm agreeing with that. Can make him making mistakes in moments, but I'm saying but even James his has moments. Jameis never, James, James has never done that either. So uh, again, it's like Ooh, has Jameis never been to? You're the in room? no man. If you're if you're deciding between those two, you're in no man's land. I only marginally. I know, but Jameis like, would be like five million dollars. Yeah, still, man, just for a couple of yucks uh, when he makes a dumb joke or says something stupid in an interview. Like, nah, that's not enough for me, man. I want good ass football. That's not that's what, I'm, what saying. I'm, I'm just saying is that if it's Derek Carr or Jameis Winston, is there really that big of a difference in your expectation for the future? Uh, I don't know, man. I don't I mean, think so. The thing, like, is that like it's just like a, just a just another guy? The Jag, just another guy. But how about this? Is that how? It, well, look, he's a name that people are interested in right now. Jameis Winston's a forgotten man. He's a uh, completely forgotten. Like he's like I don't even know what's happened to him. Andy Dalton beat him out. Um, he was hurt, and then when he was healthy, they decided Dalton gave them a better chance than uh, somebody. James. Somebody else's stock has risen though. Strangely, Derek Carr is going to make more money than everybody in a sense, and he hasn't. His stock isn't even good, gone up or down. It's just been me. Daniel Jones, bro. Uh, the the, the the Daniel Jones is going to hit free agency, or he's hitting free. He's in a kind. They didn't pick up his fifth year option. The Giants just had their best season in like uh almost six or seven seven years, something like that, and he was. Uh, very good late in the season and into the playoffs. The like he has the leverage here. Imagine this is imagine the New York Giants. What do the do the Giants have to sign him? And we're talking about Derek Carr, thirty two million dollars. Derek Carr is uh, if you traded for Derek Carr, you have to pay thirty two million dollars. We haven't paid. We put. We probably have three quarterbacks on the roster, and for the last five years, I haven't paid half of that and by the way this means that the saints are willing to give up whatever is required for Derek carr if they want him because they're not going to let him go to a play to a team that isn't going to be willing to match the compensation compensation that they want in a trade so no, I, the, the dude, raiders will trade him for anything dude because they will they can't bring him back and they don't want to pay him anything so i like, hope get, how about this i hope Derek carr goes to new orleans I hope it happens. Daniel Jones, uh, though. That's what yeah. I want to know. Is that 38 million? Think about that. Daniel Jones. I thought we were talking about him. Did you mute anyway. yourself? I Did you want to talk about Daniel Jones? I, I just wanted to mention it. I just want to mention it as we're talking about these quarterbacks going around. It's expensive. Yeah, Daniel Jones, is, they're, they're saying it's going to be between 35 and thirty-seven million per year. God, dude, that's so much money for a quarterback that just this that you year. you don't even like. Yeah, he think about paying Derek Carr. Think about how ma- how mad everybody's been at Baker Mayfield. How mad everybody's been at Sam Darnold. Imagine paying them twice as much money and then getting the same production. Yeah, that's asinine, <laughs> dude. That's fucking absurd. Um, All right, let's go to yeah. the next call. What's going on, C3 Nation? This is your boy, Jay Anderson, eating y'all up. What up, Jay? Um, you know, first of all, I want to say, like, you know, I'm cool. I'm good with the hire of Israel um, Everard. I think that's how you spell it. Say his name. I'm bad. Sometimes I'm bad with na- announcing names. But um, I think it's a good hire, man. Um, he's a, a, He had a great – he had a um, great defensive scheme with Denver – you know, last year did he, he did a great job with them. One thing I want to get on some people that I saw on Twitter saying like we got an elite uh, all star coaching staff, and I'm like, and I'm looking at the list of the coaching staff, and we only have five people in. My thing is, it's kind of like pump your brakes. I mean, we only got like five people already 
end, I'm like, we missing a lot. We missing the OC. We missing the tight ends coach. We missing the wide receiver coach. And I'm more of, you know, we kind of like need to pump our brakes and stuff. I understand the hype. I understand of being excited of a new regime because of the whole Matt Rule situation and stuff like that and just something new. But sometimes – I think people, you can be excited, but you also got to be humble. I mean, it's just like some people just need to be humble. I myself, it's like, all right, we got these pieces. Now I want to see how it works. I'm one who wants to see it on the field. You can bring in everything on paper. I don't care about paper because, you know, you don't win championships on paper. You win championships on the field. And I want to see how all of that works on the field. Because just because you got a great defensive coordinator, you probably could have a bummy, a bummy ass, um, defensive, um, defensive back coach. So I want to see all that work in before I even get excited. And I'm not knocking anybody from getting excited and stuff like that. I understand that it's like, but the whole elite and all star coaching staff, when you only got five people in already, I think that's just focus. But that's just me. Anybody got a problem with it, I mean, hey, that's you. But I, that's from my perspective, I don't, you know, I don't get the whole elite and all-star staff with only five people still in. Right. Every time I hear the word elite, I think of Matt Rule. <laughs> You no, know, I think it's like, the opposite of Matt Rule. But I know, but, I mean, like, it's like it almost ruined the word for me. So is that like elite used to mean a really cool, very talented group of people. And then I heard Matt Rule uh, say the word elite for the last two and a half years. And it turns out that elite really meant a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> you, know what, you, know what he ruined? you know what he ruined for me? Well, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, anytime I or anyone else says at the end of the day, I can't not fucking think about Matt Rule, dude. I know. Oh, it's so annoying. I can't stand it. Who would have known that elite meant dog shit at your uh, job? But, dude, I, dude, how could we have done any better than what we did, man? Like, it, it, it's so early in the process. Like, we're, we're not done building the yeah, team. I think it's exciting right now. I think it's yeah. exciting is that I would say I'm, uh, I think that, you know, Pat McAfee, I think, and I didn't get to see it. So I'm hearing somebody talk about Pat McAfee's show today. And he said this is potentially, as you look at like Sean Payton, Jim Harbaugh, and those names, did it actually turn out that Frank Wright was really the bell of the ball? Like, is he actually the best? If you think about like what might be the best for our future or any team's future, is Frank Wright really the best pick of the litter? Potentially, all he's got to do is get one Super Bowl, and then he just would be just as good as Peyton. You know, it's like what separates you? Is he really? He might be the dude. We'll see. We'll see. Um, before we get too far into the next call and this and that, I have. To remind you guys that the C3 Panthers podcast is sponsored by Prize Picks. And Prize Picks is the website to go to, the app, the the engine of daily fantasy football sports. And I tell you what, you will love it. You get to go and uh, make money, real money, safe and secure, easy to deposit, easy to withdraw. Uh, and you can make a lot of it. You can also be frustrated using the promo code c3 you can get a 100 percent deposit match on your first time deposit and right now is the time to do it because one great thing about prize picks they know we love playing they know we love being like looking forward to all of this and i popped up the screen cody and guess what they got right now a free square yeah you got a f- free play right now which automatically enhances your odds to win right now go and patrick mahomes on the free square in the super bowl don't forget to use promo code c3 now 
The way prize picks works, folks, is that you have to pick multiple picks, similar to like a parlay type system, is the more picks you make, the greater the payouts, right? But you're not gambling. You are playing daily fantasy football sports, and you are just simply uh, playing against uh, over more or less against the projection, the line that they set on that player. All Patrick Mahomes has to do is pass one yard, and that counts as one of my plays here. We got to find at the minimum of one more, but, bro, I got to use this freebie to make some moolah on this Super Bowl. We're going to find a quick one. Jalen well, Hurts. Didn't, didn't you already put $25 on uh, la- last Tuesday on the point five? Did I? Yeah, was I that so. here last Tuesday? Go under your already? entries. Go under your uh, your entries. Did I already do it? Oh, yeah, you sure did. You sure did. Oh, you sure still did. up there. Okay, dang it, I got excited. All right, well, guess what? That still works for you guys. You're exactly right. All right, well, now we got to just win it all for ourselves right here. Where are we looking at? Passing oh, yards. Oh man, do. Do uh passing um bu- 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 let's do this here rushing yards we'll click go through it Miles Sanders sixty Pacheco forty eight I wouldn't be messing with any of these numbers right here this one's an interesting one it's not something it's kind of risky you know what I'm saying is that what's his numbers forty six and a half he has oh. not he stayed in the pocket like. But he didn't like. La- they dominated so much in the last game. Is well, that basically? Hurt. Yeah. The basically the closer the game is, though, the more potential he is going to have to bust out a run. You know, and that's the way you make that number. Pocket breaks down, and he picks up fifteen. He picks up twenty in big chunk at one time, and then they use them somehow. It's still a. It's it's not something I feel great about. Another thing I never do is mess with anybody in rushing yards for the Chiefs. Look, they don't even have their other running back up here. Hey, go it's to Pacheco. Go Oof. to receiving go to re, go to receiving touchdowns. Receiving uh, touchdowns. Uh, uh, on punts. Let's see. Here's receptions. Uh like this. I like AJ Brown. I'm taking that one. Well there's uh that. uh that's a lot of catches, Kelsey. Oh, is I that thought, what you just want to go? Is I, I after Kelsey? Man. Kelsey, yeah. Kelsey has a uh, uh, for Where a touch. Is it? Where is it? Let me look at mine. Oh, here it is. I got it. Will he get a touchdown? Did uh, we do dude, that one last week? We did that one last week. Probably so, but that's money, though. Gosh, you think so? Like, no. Is this one rushing reception touchdowns? White chocolate says Pacheco receiving yards. There's one to look at. Let's see. Let me tell you mine, dude. I had a yeah. Nice tell me, tell me. I need some help, bro. I've been on this. I don't uh, trust myself right now. It's Kadarius Tony, twenty three yards. I feel like they've been using him more lately. <laughs> That he just didn't do anything in the last. Look at that. All right. I have the Patrick Mahomes at the point five. I have Jalen Hurts at more than 1.5 passing touchdowns. I have Travis Kelsey uh, at more than 0.5 receiving touchdowns. Dude, that's that's free. Uh <laughs> You you have, so I mean, it's you have, no, I agree. I look, Anthony said the same thing, dude. That's that that's you have to have that one. Uh, and I have uh Isaiah Pacheco and Miles Sanders at more than 108.5. Look at that. Oh, that's what he's saying right there. Pacheco has to catch one pass out the backfield. All right, this is what I'm rocking with. I'm rocking with Pacheco more than. 14 and a half receiving Tony more than 23 and a half receiving Kelsey and AJ Brown, more than five receptions. There we go. Using the Jiggly. promo code C three. If, Oh, here, let's just share what this would do. I dropped a 20 spot on that. And if that was to, Ooh, I did the PowerPoint. I didn't even go flex. Did I? 
Nope, nope, I just went all in. This is almost over, baby. We gotta go all in. This would, uh, oh, uh, would pay ten times if, if if they all hit twenty in the two hundred. Need it, baby. Need to pull both of these off. I went all in on this Super Bowl. Um, we gotta start thinking about watching the Super Bowl. It's like it's gonna be uh right around the corner, just days away. Let's go to the next call. The number is two five two 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 eight. 5098. That's 252 228 Don't p- forget to prize picks promo code C3. Hey guys, it's the growl that makes them howl. Oh, so quiet, Joey. The blind Panther, whose roar you stopped on the intro today. Oh, uh, but did we? That yeah, you said, stopped it early. How did I stop I'm it? I'm already loving what Frank know, Reich is doing it. and the guys that he's bringing in. Now, I love Steve Wilkes, and I'm very happy that he got to go and be on Kyle Shanahan's coaching staff. I mean, you don't get called up by the big one that often. So, uh, good for him. And uh, as for the Panthers... Look at our division. Yeah, Brady just retired and left the Bucks. And I have a question about an article. I heard somewhere that Tom Brady said that us making him eat shit, not score and not score a touchdown, played a part in his decision to retire. I don't know how true that is because we've never been that relevant since Cam Newton was here. But if it is, that's freaking awesome. But look at our division, dude. The Bucks don't have a quarterback. The Saints have Dennis Allen as their head coach, and they don't really have a quarterback. And the Falcons are the Falcons. Dude, we have the best coaching staff in the division. And we look the best on paper, which... Yeah, guys, we always look good on paper. Always. You notice that? We always look good on paper, and then we suck. So, uh, I'll just leave you with that. I'm really excited about Ijiro Ivero. Uh, I'm about that shit. Anyway, guys. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, I like that. Tony, I haven't heard one person who isn't excited about a Jero Evero. 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 I think Everybody's it's because we're familiar enough with names that and terminology surrounding him. And what I mean by that is like the Broncos, right? And we know the Broncos had a pretty good defense. So we're familiar with that. You can say like the with the Rams in the secondary and they were in the Super Bowl. So you can think about that. And then you can think about Fangio. You've heard that name. If you would have just said like, oh, this is the next up and coming defensive coordinator though from like college or something I didn't know anything about like that, it would be more daunting. So I think that makes that familiarity in a sense like is that he's been around the league so you can throw those names out, that pedigree It's not just one thing. It's not just Denver. It's like two or three other things that are sounding cool about it. Yeah. Uh, Then he was interviewed for a head coaching job. So there's some just things that right away that make it um, that sort like sort of soften it to you, right? And then you're like, oh, well, now then it becomes exciting. So like, I don't know how you could not be uh, like excited about it. Like, it's the best name. That other people are talking about. Like, tell me who's the best. Like, what? who would have been better? Flores, who just got the job with Minnesota? I don't think so. It's like, how can you not be excited about it? Like, what would be the better? That's why I like the Frank Wright thing, too, is, you know what, to be honest, just thinking about it is like it comes with a kind of (sighs) a comfort. Like, Peyton would have come with stress. The Sean Peyton pick would have come with stress. His right. personality, then you got to defend whether or not he's worth it. The trade, the fucking, then we'd be dealing with Saints fans all the time. It'd just be stress. 
everywhere. We'd be going like to war with our thoughts about it. This, I'm just like, hell yeah, I'm gonna rock with these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about Ajero, man. I, I think I, I'm more pumped about him than I would have been about Flores. No lie, like yeah, I, I mean, and, and I, I, I think Flores is, is like really a guy good. that comes with the weight of a head coach right away. It just He's the young guy with the hot name. Right now, dude, Ejero Ivero is all the rage right now, dude. And he's yeah. in Carolina Panther, man. Amen. That's what matters. And the idea of somebody leaving another team, turning down the Vikings for us, that makes it feel cool, too. Just makes it like, oh, man, we got chosen. Uh, next call. What's up, C3? It's Anthony. Just a quick part, too. Um, just wanted yeah. to talk about some stuff. First off, this Hogwarts Legacy game is fire, man. Like, if y'all haven't tried it, it is awesome. Like, just choosing your own um, Expelliarmus or Lither and all that, it is awesome. It's a great game. And second, me and Cody Latt were talking about this a little bit, but if you want to trade up, you need to know what quarterback you want. Like, Panther fans, from what I've been seeing, are just like, well, let's just trade up to the number one spot. But for me, it's like kind of goes back to what Scott Fitter said. If there's a guy out there and you're convicted by him, then go get him. So I I don't want to just trade up all the way to the one spot, give up the future draft capital if you're not even 100% on who you want. Like if if they're like, all right, we like C.J. Shroud, then you you can go up. And trade for him, but I I don't want to I don't want to just go trade up to the number one spot and then have us sitting there debating like down to the final minutes of our pick who our quarterback's going to be because then that tells me that they they weren't confident in you know the quarterback they want to select. So just give me your thoughts on that, and um, I think we're I, I'm coming in with some hot takes. I think we're going to win the NFC South next year. And, yeah, I really do. Whether it's Derek Carr at QB or, like, if we if we, if we we um, sign Derek Carr and we don't draft a quarterback, then at least let Matt Corral get some second-team reps in, in training camp. At least see what he has at this point. Like, I, I don't necessarily love Matt Corral like Cody does, but I don't hate him. Like, we drafted him. You might as well just show what he can do in some situation. I said this last year. It was bullshit. The, the Matt Rule was never going to let him be the quarterback because he had his eyes set on Baker. But if there was a legit quarterback competition, I bet he could have came in and done some things. He could have showed that he was a solid quarterback. Right. So just give me your thoughts on that. And, yeah, Anthony from Charlotte. Thanks for all the work y'all do week in and week out. I'll see y'all Friday. Keep motherfucking pounding. Appreciate you, Anthony. Uh, go ahead. You take his call, no. and then I want to talk about the Hogwarts mess. If you're going to trade up, we better have a specific player in mind. You know, I if it's with the idea of, oh, let's trade up just to make sure that we're in position to get one of the two, like that's why I wish that there was a quarterback prospect that was just easy to fall head over heels in love with. And, and again, I really like CJ Stroud. I like Bryce Young, but I'm not in love with them like a lot of people are. And I'm going to be real. I think it's because of our drought at the quarterback position that it makes it so much worse. Panther fans are like, please just give me a quarterback. And I understand it, man. I've been where you are. I know how you feel. Um, I, I, you know, we we need to be certain about who the quarterback is if we're going to trade up for one. And the number two, I don't think Matt Corral is ever at this point going to get uh, a legit competition. I told you. I told you. That's why you've been hoping for it. I mean, but it's not because of him, though. Like, if they gave him an opportunity. That's because he got hurt last year. He would have yeah, needed. Yeah, but, like, if he, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer. If you gave him the opportunity to play with the ones and show what he's capable of. Not how the of, NFL works, though, bro. I know, but it's look, Sam moment. Howell, Sam Howell it's, might start for Washington next year. If he would have not. Look, the only way that Matt, uh, that Matt Corral was ever going to potentially have a role 
in the Carolina Panthers future was for everything to go terrible last year for the team and him not be hurt and come in and look good. Yeah. But sadly he got hurt. So like that window was that window closed, but I didn't know that there was a new Hogwarts game, which is. Yeah. Um, dude, it's all the rage. Know right about now. that. Everyone's but playing. I did see. So it like, is that uh, uh Harry Potter? Like, so you bring this up. This is was poking around the end. Did you see this mess today? No. The Harry there's Potter. No, there's no music in it, is it? Yeah. We'll get fucking dinged. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Yes. Say it after me. Repeat after me. Okay. Nigga, please. <laughs> Nigga, please. What? This, this broke the internet today. <laughs> Did he want her to say it too? Look, the whole internet went crazy about this. Uh, this was the oh, internet today. I do RIP to her. I don't Man. think so. I think this is, I think the internet's going to destroy this. And I think that this is all meant to be part of something. Like, we need to see more context. Right. Cause that you can't just say, like, is that, cause you can't say, say this after me and on live stream it to a girl that's from <laughs> England. <laughs> <laughs> can we watch it one more time dude, but do you know this dude is by it the way? wrong to watch it actually that's what i've been thinking about is today as the internet went nuts about this is it wrong to watch these things should we just not but watch it? do you know, do you know this Turn dude it off. Turn did, it off. this dude is like uh he's like the most do you know him person. yeah dude this that guy, guy that I don't know guy who any on, of these people is tell me that, who these that, are. That, no 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 that dude on on twitch Probably pulls in the most viewers out of anyone. Who is he? I, I don't know his name. And why is dude, he with those people? Dude, why is dude, he, he with is, that? That looks like the real. That's not really Harry Potter. These are fake Harry Potter people. Oh, what well, dude? I mean, they're just oh. wearing. Uh, yeah, okay. Kais and that. <laughs> Jordan. Yeah, Kais and that dude. He's hilarious. Uh, yeah, dude. All of his clips are always going viral, dude. <laughs> I was not ready for that. I'm not gonna lie. Ah, crazy! Uh, you weren't ready. For, you didn't see that. I love. I, this. No, I had not. I had not seen that one time at all. Oh man, that was going around today, just like his. And then you get caught up reading the comments about what people think. You know what I'm saying, and what the way it is. I just be careful. Consume your day. Um, next call, last one right now. Hey guys. It's, the girl it's quiet, now, Joey. A.K.A. Joey the Blind Panther again. And y'all were talking about something very interesting to me. Y'all were talking about uh, entering into talks with the Bears for the number one pick, which I've never be, really been a fan of trading up for a quarterback, especially if you're going to have to give up that much. But... Because it's the Bears, it brought up something very interesting. I think we would do better to trade for Justin Fields. Because if you think about it from the Bears' perspective, if we call them up and we offer them decent compensation for Justin Fields, who I believe is still on his rookie contract, I'm not sure. Um, say maybe two thirds and a fourth. All right, for Justin Fields, I think the Bears would take that because they have the number one pick. If you give, if you trade for, if you give them decent compensation for Justin Fields, they could go get their quarterback. Okay, it's not like Justin Fields is not very important to the Bears right now. And, I mean, based off what Cody says about how good he is as a quarterback, he might have the potential to be more than just a bridge quarterback for us, which I really think that's interesting because, no, I would not be trading for the number one pick. I, I don't think that we should do that especially for an Ohio State quarterback, but really for any college quarterback, because you know how I feel about that. But I would trade with the Bears for Justin Fields. Anyway, guys. Wow, wow, wow. 
Dude, I'm not mad. If I got a notification tomorrow saying the Panthers traded for Justin Fields, dude, I don't view it in the same light that I would Sam Donald and Baker Mayfield. I just wouldn't. I think he has much more talent than either of those two. So, yeah, even though it's a retread, it's not quite the retread that other retreads have been for the Panthers. So I hear you, Joey. I hear you, man. I would do it. I love Justin Fields' upside. Put some better talent around him. Put an offensive line in front of him. Yeah, man, why not? But who knows? Um, Only thing, uh, that's the last call for right now, did, so it's just kind of... Do you even want to talk about this Matt Rule shit? Uh, no, I actually just want to put this up. Is can If you can just power through this. Uh, the Panthers, I think the latest news is that they, or today, it's the seventh, right? Yeah. Uh, Panthers are parting ways with a VP of player personnel, Pat Stewart, per sources. This is according to Joe Person. Uh, Pat Stewart joined the Panthers during Matt Rule's tenure. The team worked together at Western Carolina and Temple. Uh, so player VP of player personnel. I wonder how long his contract was like going through. Like what's the timing of this is it's, it's crazy actually to see there's still people that are linked and being purged deep into the bowels of the Matt rule legacy. But the one thing that came up to me about this is that we didn't mention this last, um, I think you guys talked about it on the Friday free for all a lot, the arbitration suit, Matt rules now suing yeah. the Carolina Panthers. So it's just Matt rule, Matt rule, Matt rule, Matt fool. And that made me think this is something that I said last week in the show about Matt, uh, Frank Reich's press conference. And one of the takeaways that I came, uh, that I had was that Frank Reich, it just felt like, uh, it wasn't about him. His ego wasn't uh, so big that it needed to be fed. It There was a comfortability, a uh, comfortness, comfortability, that's not a word, comfort level there, uh, a, a, a security, a self-security that came with him that Matt Rule was the opposite of in that ego part. And what's interesting is I saw a story just because we're going into Super Bowl week, right, is about now everybody's going to be looking at least the thing that I guess the archetype for where you want to be. There's two teams right now you want to be. You want to be the Chiefs or you want to be the Eagles this weekend. And so maybe you're looking towards those teams for some sort of wisdom, the blueprint, the archetype, the Pat Mahomes. And the story comes up on The Athletic that Nick Sirianni, one of the things the players, they really, his ego has a, is not a problem. And uh, just going to bring this up as kind of a couple of points. You can read this really. It's really, it's really an interesting article about uh, Nick Sirianni and how uh, we are judgments about him and that awkward first press conference. Right, we made fun of Nick Sirianni. I was part of it completely. We're gonna have the best systems where our systems are gonna be so good that we won't even have to think. We'll just be playing better than everybody because our systems are perfect. And uh, this story, kind of, they asked. They've asked a lot of players about how they felt about him. This is Brandon Graham. He said he won me over when he first got here. Um, that first press conference he had, that he said all the wrong things. When y'all got, and he said, when y'all got on him, and that's so he's talking about us, like all of us, like you know, it's like he didn't say, you know, it just was weird, it just wasn't good. He said, I just felt like he came in here and gave us his honest answer about how he felt, and he was pissed about it. And I love that because a lot of coaches wouldn't admit to sometimes when the media get under their skin, right? And so I think there was like a humility that comes there. Maybe potentially from Siriana, who was very brazen Italian kid. But then this is something he moved on, Cody, from head coach. Like last year, he called plays. Last year, he called plays, and it wasn't as good. And he passed it on. And this is what he said about it. He said, where a lot of problems happen in the NFL is from an ego standpoint. 
I felt like there needed to make a change in the sense of how it could free me up to be a better head coach. And I had a good assistant to call the plays. So that's what I went with. Matt Rule's ego was a problem. Matt Rule's ego was a problem. And these players who are talking so good about Sirianni, there's more of them. Just read like the whole story is all about that. It's like, man, like we really just respect like what's going on here. There has never been anyone connected to the Panthers organization now that I think I can't stand more than Matt Rule. For the longest time, it was Kelvin Benjamin above everyone. Right. Oh. Yeah. Dude, Who's that? Was, Cal, yeah. Oh, dude. It, exactly. It was, it was, oh, that's it a was good point. Kelvin, Kelvin Benjamin, first and foremost. You know what? A lot of us still feel some type of way about D'Angelo Williams, who's talked a bunch of shit. Yeah, but about he was a Carolina really Panthers. good player, though. Right. But this, but that's what I'm saying. Matt Rule, as someone who never accomplished absolutely anything at all with the Carolina Panthers, then his uh, original press conference was all me, 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 me. He tried to run this organization like a dictatorship. And now he has the unmitigated gall to sue the Panthers, saying that they owe him $5 million? Dude, fuck off, man. What are you even doing? They're even saying now that um, his contract with Nebraska, they backloaded it so that the Panthers would have to pay more up front. Dude, he's just a cancer on the ass of this organization. If I never hear his name another day in my life, it'll be too fucking soon, bro. I cannot stand this man. Yeah, I think he's public enemy number he's, one. He's everything I dislike in another man. Just spineless, uh, can't answer for his own faults, just an absolute moron, and I cannot stand him, dude. Yeah. That's all I just wanted to, but I th- I just thought it was interesting as we continue to work. Like, yeah, when I see is this, as you guys, as we continue to debate all of these things, is really we are heading into the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 57 this Sunday, the uh, Kansas City Chiefs face off against the Philadelphia Eagles. And, you know, there's a lot of names uh, we should probably watch, particularly with the Eagles, some names uh, that are going to come up that might be. Uh, good additions to the Carolina Panthers. And there's that history and that connection with Frank Reich and all of that. So, you know, you know, watch that organization, right, for some cues. We probably need to look towards Jacksonville, too, because of those relationships between Reich and Peterson and even the idea of them interviewing their offensive coordinator. Um, is that... So those are the things that I, I was thinking of. I don't think that there's any um, other things to talk about when it comes to. I don't. That's about all I got, really, for the yeah. show. Yeah, I mean, um, hey, any about, other news we missed? Uh, oh, Aaron Rodgers well, is going on a four day tar- darkness retreat. Did you? You want to know what? You want to know what I, I want to do? even more than talk about Aaron Rodgers. You know, I don't have, uh, I don't have the voice that makes them moist, but I can still give y'all. Subscribers saying bitches, 129 people watching 86 thumbs up. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe. Hit that notification bell. For every single time the C3 Panthers podcast goes live, you know we don't take any any weeks off, man. We're here all year round, brand new Panther content. If you enjoy it, hit that like, hit that subscribe, hit that notification bell. Boys, we're on the road to 5,000 subscribers. So close. Help us out, man. Help us out. Hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. Tell somebody you know and love that you know the coolest damn Panthers hangout on the entire interwebs, bro. That's us right here. C3 Panthers podcast. Help us grow, man. Help us grow. Going into the, actually, this is what's awesome about the Super Bowl, Cody is when we come back on Tuesday, 
it will be season 20 and not season 23 this will be our 11th season but i always i'd like to mark them on the year 20 22 23 24 see, right is this will be season 23 but our 11th season every week we've put out content for going back we start about the second month of 2013 if even that four weeks into the the season haven't missed a week. I was calculating, even if we just did one episode a week for a le- uh, 10 years, that'd be 520 episodes. And we yeah. have done post game shows now for three years, I think. We have done the Friday free for all for the last two years. We're de- this podcast is way over 600 episodes. Yeah, That's insane. Man. And hey, 11 is your lucky number, right? Mr. 11 11, yes, going into your 11th season. Yes, on these toes, let's, baby. Go. Let's, go, man. let's go. Let's go. Um, 11's up, put them 11s up. Hey, man. Um, look, I appreciate you, Tony. I love being on the show, being here with you, rapping every Tuesday, every Friday, and uh, and being able to hang out with y'all and these incredible Panther that's fans, fun. man. Y'all, y'all make my Tuesday every Tuesday night. And speaking of the longest running Panthers podcast, it's the longest running segment on the C3 Panthers podcast. And that is our homage to Steve Smith, where we tell someone to ice up, toughen up, to get it together. Everyone is fair game. Anyone is fair game. This is the one time this show, actually not the one time, we do whatever the hell we want on this show, but this is the time of the show we dedicate for us to go into the football world or outside the football world and tell somebody to ice up, toughen up, to get it together. Cody, I don't know. You got a great one. I don't have, I have what, like, I actually feel bad now after showing that video. No, I have, I have, I have two okay. to make up for one day. You know. But first... Ice up. Um, let's get somebody. Let's tell someone to ice up, toughen up to get it back together. You go right. one, then I'll go one, then you give your second. All right, all right, that sounds fair. Um, so mine, uh, I'm icing up people first who don't watch what they say, and people who don't watch where they're looking. First one, we you have to learn how to mine what you say especially if there are young, impressionable ears around. Mom? Yeah, puppy. Do we have a cat? No, why would you say we have a cat? Because Dad last night was saying, oh, I'm going to beat that kitty, baby. Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what Nobody was saying You need to be cat. in bed, all right? Go, go, go. Go, go, go inside. Go to bed. Go to bed. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't trust anything. I don't even give, how about this? I don't even give a fuck. That is hilarious. <laughs> Actually, let's oh watch God. it one more time. I yeah. think this here. Let's here. Do you want to know how we can find out if this video is fake? Yeah. Let's watch it one more time, and you pay attention to when he spits his beer out. If he spits his beer out in a natural way of hearing what the kid said, which I felt like he did, it might actually be real. Let's watch it one more time. Yeah, puppy. Do we have a cat? No, why would you say we have a cat? Because dad last night was saying, oh, I'm going to beat that kitty, baby. Why would you oh, no, that? it's fake. What, it's what, fake. What you I don't fake. know, dude. Look, why was he holding bed, his right? beer up to his face so long? One more time. Jeez. Look at it. Look, is that he goes to take a sip. Look, why is he holding it like that? Oh, I'm going to beat that kitty. Waiting. Yeah, he was waiting. Uh, Wait. Dude, I don't know. Dude, I don't even care. In my mind, it's real. And it's fucking okay. hilarious. And you should okay. watch what you say, man. Kids pick up stuff, dude. So uh, to uh, to these parents. <sighs> no, I suck. I know. You know, man, even if they use their kid to get TikTok views. Um, here's my ice up pick. And I feel bad because we were talking about that show, the other video on this one, but 
this one uh saw this flash across my news feed Aramark apologizes for un- uh, unintentional insensitivity after students uh, serving students chicken and what? watermelon on the first day of black history how do people still do this shit dude this is what it said is they were asking people if they want watermelon and i remember being confused because it's not even in season (laughs) (laughs) she said uh but were, anyway, they doing that, it, were they doing it on purpose? Like no, they were nah. well, look, who knows actually people? how you think this. The offering of chicken and waffles as an entree with watermelon as oh, a dessert uh, was oh, inexcusably inoffensive, uh, Johnson told the outlet. Here, look, what does Aramark say back? It says this. Uh, we, all right, this is what they said. We apologize for the unintentional insensitivity shown on February 1st, the first day of Black History Month. While our menu was not intended as a cultural meal, we acknowledge that the timing was inappropriate and our team should have been more thoughtful in its surface. That's actually like the only, that's the exact thing you have to say in there because either it was intentional or you are not paying attention and totally incompetent. But I agree, I agree with VZV. Chicken and waffles is one thing. Chicken, waffles, and watermelon. That's fucking wild, How can we make this meal heart healthy? Well, put some fruit. Oh, gosh. I know. That was my iced up pick. It was my iced up pick. I was like, come on. Like you said, is no one caught that? Yeah, dude. I don't know. No one caught that. They're like, you know what? Uh, so what are we gonna make tomorrow? You know yeah. what? Let's do chicken waffles. Anybody else yeah. got it? Like and yeah. watermelon <laughs> to top it off. That's fucking crazy. So okay, the first one was watch what you say. This one is even more simple. Watch where you're going, bro. I've been having a lot of sexual escapades as I let you know, like having little adventures <laughs> with some freaky Chicago girls. And I've come to the realization, I've been talking to one, that I don't think pegging is necessarily that gay. (laughs) (laughs) It just falls off the stage, dude. I've been having a lot of... And and the the guy trying to help him The joke itself, think about this, is your joke is starting (laughs) with the lead. I don't think pegging is gay. And then he just fucking eats it. (laughs) Then he eats a D. It's necessarily that gay. (laughs) Dude. And then the guys are trying to help him up. Uh, It looks like he's wrestling. A lot of sexual escapades, as I let you know, like having little adventures with some freaky Chicago girls, and I've come to the realization... I've been How do you not know where the end of the stage is? I don't think is necessarily that gay. Oh. <laughs> Dude. Stupid <laughs> ass. Dude, I sucks. love that. Watch your step, bro. Yeah, but if you're a stand-up comic, watch where you're going, dude. That's all dirt. I was saying, man. He definitely did eat dirt, oh, man. That's but that's it, man. That's my, uh, that's my ass up. All right, wonderful. That's the C3 Panthers podcast brought to you by CarolinaCatChronicles.com where every Tuesday night we chop up the latest Panthers news and opinions from the fan perspective. We'd love for you to be a part of the show next week. Also, Friday, coming up Friday, free for all. It has been lit, Cody. uh, The cult is growing. And uh, as that cult grows, they are becoming members of the C3 Panthers. Super fan club. They're subscribing on YouTube. And on Friday, you guys really get it done, bro. Tony, every Friday at 7 p.m., I am building an elite squadron of (laughs) Panther operatives to help us take over the podcasting world, baby. They're my 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 Myrmidon, my my own personal army. And we're building them more and more every single Friday, 7 p.m. You be a part of the show. Join via StreamYard. Dude, I swear, every single show we have 10 people on, and the discussions get better and better and better. Uh, so join us every Friday at 7 uh, seven p.m., man, and uh, be a part of the show for Panther fans, by Panther fans. And Tony, right at the end we of gotta the show. We got to do this one. Yeah, we got to do a it. A donation from Quell Davis's weight 
what's y'all's favorite Steve Smith moment? Dude, right. that I don't think we can say the ice. I mean, I guess you could say that, but we I mean it's an easy go to when we just did the ice up picks. Yeah. Um, um I'll tell you this is there's a couple of it's like, do you want the mean Steve Smith moment? My favorite moment is is Steve Smith against the Bears in oh five or six like it wasn't the year we went to the Super Bowl. We went to the Super Bowl. And it would have been about 05. We went and we lost to the Seattle Seahawks in the NFC Championship. But we beat the Bears uh, going to, what, I guess, what's that, the divisional realm? Um, yeah. And Steve Smith had something like two receiving touchdowns and a punt return and a kick. Like, he had like five touchdowns, it felt like, in this game. And he was returning punts for us. He was, I mean, this dude was just straight nasty, bro. All over the place. That game, he single-handedly torched the fucking Bears. I'm going to look up those stats real quick as you tell us your Steve Smith moment. Dude, I have the first touchdown pass from Cam Newton to Steve Smith against the Cardinals burned into my retina i'll never forget that i'll never forget steve smith damn near starting a fight with roman harper in the end zone that was a great moment that i always remember i always love um and dude sadly enough um his return to carolina when he was with the ravens went off for like two touchdowns i think 200 plus yards or something like that told everybody to take care of his lawn while he was absent, you know, uh, All right. that was, that was a pretty legendary moment too. Although it wasn't with our Panthers, but, uh, shout out to Steve, man. Just an absolute warrior, dude. So many memories, man. Yeah. Here's the full box score is Steve Smith in this game had 12 catches for 218 yards and two touchdowns. That's pretty badass. I swear he did something on special teams. <laughs> Yeah, uh, punt returns. Okay, uh, no, maybe I'm just misremembering. I thought he had had more than that, but that game, he fucking decimated him. That game right there sticks out to me. 12 catches, 218 yards. A badass. Yep. Badass motherfucker. Best Interesting. Mohsin Muhammad was on that uh, Chicago team. Yeah. Um. All right, that's it. Um. Look. We'll be here forever until we're not. <laughs> Cody, yeah. let's get out of here. C3 Panther Nation, until next time, keep pounding.